And here we go. We have liftoff. Propulsion continues to be normal. Our CPA chamber pressure looks good. Following up. Unfolds to go. Indeed. We rise together back to the moon and beyond. This is methane to be igniting the flare, correct? Yikes. You bet. We don't need any more of these. Good afternoon, everyone out there on YouTube. We are witnessing, hopefully very shortly, the lifting of uh, Ship 25 onto Booster 9 over at Starbase in Texas. And I am Lon Seidman. I will be your host for the afternoon here. And I've got some experts joining me, uh, from two folks from across the pond. I have Ryan Caton. How you doing, Ryan? Doing very well, Ron. Been sat here for a little while, waiting for them to lift, but fingers crossed we'll get it going in just a short amount of time after hearing a pad clear alarm just a few moments ago. So we're, we're confident that something's going to happen very shortly. And also joining us is Alex Romera from across the pond as well. How are you doing, Alex? <laughs> well, I'm doing great. Uh, yeah, boy, I, I cannot describe how I'm feeling right now. <laughs> There's so many things going on. It's very busy. It's crazy how, how mm. active spaceflight has become and so many things going on at once and just trying to keep up with it all. And the views that we're watching here are from NSF's cameras, which are located down at Starbase. And what's amazing is just how close this is to the road, right, Alex? Like, this is, like, so easy to get these shots because there's nothing really bordering <laughs> this launch pad and the public highway. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's pretty much next to the road. You can go down Highway 4 and get to the to the place. And I believe now we have the card there for Jack as well. I think he's there uh, in the field, uh, as as one will say. Uh, that, that was sort of a joke from yesterday, if you all were there for, for the rollout stream. That was fun. Uh, yeah, it, you can pretty much pull up uh, there, obviously with a lot of caution. I'm not a local or anything like that, but I know people have been there. And everything um so yeah it's it's really a, a great access that we have to the world's most powerful rocket be amazing and and uh, jack is out in the field and he'll pop in as he can there's some signal issues he's having with his phone so when we can get him we will uh, ping him to see how things are going now uh ryan we heard some Hi, announcements. oh there you are oh <laughs> field is talking so we will see him unmute and uh, communicate with us as as the conditions allow for for, for here so uh, so, Ryan, we are live now because we heard some announcements at the pad itself, because not only do we have cameras there, we have microphones that pick up all the sound going on. So what did we hear a few minutes ago? Yeah, and I think it's even carrying on in the background here. Um, every so often you'll hear a klaxon go off and some muffled voices, and it's quite difficult to, to pick out. But essentially, I believe they're saying something along the lines of, you can hear the cacks are going off now. I believe they're saying something along the lines of uh, attention star base, pad clear now, or clear the pad, or, or something like that. Something to do with clearing the area around the pad for safety reasons. So we'll keep hearing that going off for, for a little while at least as they uh, make sure that everyone uh, gets out of the way of the ship before they lift it with the chopsticks. And Alex, they've been stacking these things for a while now, but this is still not a routine activity just yet, is it? Yeah, it's it still takes a lot of time to prepare the vehicles. It usually takes, you know, d depending on on the day, a good day usually takes three hours from you know arrival to here to starting a lift. But sometimes they they need a little bit more time. They were struggling before to get that. They have like a protection plate on the quick disconnect umbilical for the ship. They were trying to get it out and they were struggling a little bit with it. Um, and and so it kind of depends. Obviously. 
Starbase is the proving ground for all of these operations. People say, oh, how are they going to be able to, to be doing all of these things, you know, one launch every hour, if they struggle to get it lifted, you know, within a few minutes or so after arriving. It's it, it's just like that now, but it eventually get better with time. And just, right, it just takes time to, to know the hardware. The hardware mm -hmm. keeps changing. And actually, this is going to bring us to... Um, one of the questions that we came in, like that just came in on the chat, I believe. I got to see if I can find it again. But oh yeah, here is a super chat from uh, Musical Wolves, um, who's wondering if this new hot staging ring is going to be kind of uh, kind of slow us down a little bit today, because this is the first time we're stacking a starship on this new ring, right? Yeah, it it, it will actually probably be more. At least we, we we expect it to be a little more gentle uh, with the new ring installed. Um, might want to check it up, um, but we we don't really know. We, we'll obviously have to wait and see, as always. But hopefully that will happen in just a few minutes. Hopefully less than one hour. Right. Hopefully <laughs> we're, not, we're not here like waiting hours and hours and hours for the lift. Like yeah, you guys were up late last <clears> night. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's not talk about that. I was not awake, <laughs> but I know friends uh, that that are here in this in, in this live stream right now that we're awake for that. And so, um, yeah. <laughs> Got it. And I, I'm seeing Ryan a little bit of movement. Am I am I right? The heat haze definitely doesn't help, especially yeah. with all the cameras, because we have to shoot through the atmosphere. Of course, we can't. You know, it's not a vacuum. Um, so it, it is kind of deceptive sometimes. We see the heat haze make it look like it's lifting up slightly maybe, but at least from the, the, uh, the zoomed in perspective on the left, I, it's not going up just yet. It looks like we've got uh, some United Rentals kit right. there, and then we've also got a, it looks like a Starlink dish there, giving us a little bit of context between the bot bottom of the ship uh, and the ground, or at least the, the, the things on the ground. So. Yeah, the heat haze just it, it it it's our worst enemy when trying to figure out if 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 things are moving by small amounts. Right, right. It's gonna be hard with that. And it was funny. I was watching earlier, and I'm sure many of many of those in the stream are watching the uh, the guys on the cherry picker earlier. That thing was was pretty <laughs> pretty treacherous up there. But the I gotta give a lot of credit to the SpaceX uh, ground crew here. They are very brave and certainly do not have a fear of heights as they are getting things uh, ready for the lift here. And Alex, I noted that there was a lot of things getting disconnected from Starship before they were ready to do this lift here. So what, what do they have plugged into it? Because there's no fuel in the rocket right now, is there? Yeah, so during transport, you see these sort of propellant uh, lines, but it, they are actually not propellant lines. They are pressure, pressure lines that are connected to like uh, a, a control system with its own set of tanks and they are plugged into the quick disconnect, the umbilical system of the ship to be able to keep the tanks at pressure during the transport. And during the lift, they are also at, at pressure. The only difference is that they obviously need to remove the, the, so the, the basically they need to remove the, the umbilicals and they also have a protection plate that they also remove. You don't want those, you know, that system, you don't want it to be dangling 80 meters off the ground, right? Uh, when this thing is lifted. And so that's one of the things that they had to remove. One of the other things was obviously unbolting the ship from the, from the, like the, the, the stand itself has these pins, so, so to speak, uh, that hold it in place during transport. It's transport stand. That's, that's why it is called like that, right? Um, and so those were some of the things that we were looking at here when they were working on the underside of the vehicle. And the things that we're looking for next is, first of all, the quick disconnect arm for the ship needs to move out of the, of the way for the tower, because that thing is basically in the way of the quick, of the, of the chopsticks. So when the chopsticks go up, they need, you know, free space. And so they cannot move if the quick disconnect arm is in the way. So that's one of the things that we need to look for. And also the stabilizers on the arms, those little triangle things underneath the, the chopsticks, they need to move in and connect to the vehicle and they help stabilize the, the ship as it goes up. So once those go in, we'll see that ship being lifted. Got it. So there's still a little bit more here from the prep side before mm -hmm. we see things starting to move. And uh, we did get some questions. 2D arms moving right now. Oh, there we go. Ooh. So there's something happening here. An update from the field. 
And what are we looking at now, Alex? Yeah, so it, it is that arm at the middle of the tower. It's just slowly moving away. You can kind of see it. Obviously, it's not something that if you look for just one second, you're going to notice. You need to look for 10 seconds, maybe 5, but definitely not something that you instantly see and it's, oh, it's moving. Kind of have to look at it with a little bit of care. Uh, but yeah, it, it's definitely moving away. Uh, and as you can see, if it doesn't move away, once the chopsticks go up, they basically hit the the arm. So right. you don't want that don't to want happen. That. Yeah, no, exactly. we don't want anything colliding with anything else. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I do have a, a chat question here. I, I, maybe uh, Ryan can pick this one up. Is there any chance of a D stack again before launch here, or do you think this is going to be the final stack? Well, they need to do a, a critical thing, which was a kind of a big thing after the initial flight test. They need to arm the new flight termination system. They've thrown mm. some more charges in there uh, because infamously last time it took a, a, a bit longer than, than than wanted, than desired, in order for the vehicle to disassemble itself once the FTS was ignited. That needs to be armed. That cannot happen on the ship whilst it is stacked atop the booster. So they're going to need to de-stack regardless of what happens after this stack in order to arm that FTS. We saw that with the first flight and we're going to see it again with the second flight. So this, this, there will be a de-stack after this stacking. So this is, in some ways, kind of a dry run to make sure they, they understand how this new ring is going to be in place. Because that was another question, by the way, from the chat, from S24. A lot of folks are wondering about the fact that the, uh, when will the FTS be installed? It's a huge topic in the chat today. So it looks like it's not installed yet. Is that right? So, yeah, there's, there's different steps for the FTS. It's a whole story here. So and by the way, FTS is the flight termination the flight. system. Which, which basically blows up the rocket if needed. Exactly. You, you hit that, right? Um, so the FTS, you first need to install the charges. But there are obvious uh, physical barriers so that the charges are not accidentally triggered. And so those barriers are there on the vehicles pretty much till the last moment of a stack, like the last stacking. That's when they remove those uh, those physical barriers, which are like pins, basically, that they install once the charges are in there. So they pull the pins, they stack the vehicles, and then they prepare for the launch. During the launch countdown, so pulling the pins doesn't actually mean that the flight termination system is armed. It's that it is ready to receive any sort of signal. But there's an electrical inhibitor there that basically it's... It, it is showing as the, the system is disarmed, right? And during the countdown, actually during the last five minutes of the countdown, while they're preparing for the launch, during those last five minutes is when they electronically send a signal to the FTS, hey, now is when you have to look for any sort of issue and to activate. Because the this FTS is not, you know, there's no one in the ground with a big red button. Uh, pushing it on anything like that. It's an automatic flight termination system. And so it's basically the vehicle itself senses that something is going wrong. It is going, you know, in the wrong direction or anything like that, just like the first flight. And then it's like, okay, I'm done. Mm, I'm doing things that are unsafe for people on the ground. So I'm going to activate the FTS. The only problem with the first flight, though, is those charges were not enough to break the right. vehicle. <laughs> yeah. So they so have added wow. more charges. Right, so it's exactly. going to be a more powerful FTS, and I guess if you, when eventually when these things become human rated, you you have to put a lot of faith in that technology to not mm -hmm. uh, not go off inadvertently there. Hey, we yeah. got a bunch of support coming in, so uh, while we're waiting here, I'll, I'll acknowledge uh, a bunch of folks who have uh, made some contributions to our efforts here. First is uh, RC Horseman, who gifted a red team membership. Thank you very much. We had a bunch of uh, gifting going on this week, which is great because you can help the channel and you can help your fellow community members uh, get a membership, which is always a great thing. You get access to some really cool stuff. I want to thank a new member who uh, bought themselves a membership here, Jean Marie uh, Renegard. Thank you very much for your support. Ryan gifted one red team membership. And Ryan also, I'm assuming it's the same Ryan, uh, chipped in five bucks to feed the cameras. He knows they are hungry. And uh, I know Jack might be getting hungry out there, so that is very much appreciated <laughs> there. And RC Horseman also gifted a, another Red Team membership as we were waiting for uh, the lifting to commence here. And we have a um, an anonymous contribution um, via the store. And it's from, uh, oh, I guess not so anonymous, uh, Kirito Troll Cannon. Uh, when are you guys thinking launch time here? I'm guessing Monday of the month, right? There's been some talk about this because they don't yet have a license to launch yet. Is that 
correct, Alex? Oh, that's another another tale. We have lots and lots of tales here. So the the thing is with the launch license, they actually already have a launch license. The problem with that is first, it was only for the first flight. There was one of the clauses, so to speak, right? One of the conditions of the launch license was that it was for the first flight unless it is amended to be removed. So if you amend the launch license to remove that line, then it is valid for whatever other flight that, you know, undergoes the same kind of profile as the first one. Uh, the nominal profile I'm talking about here. <laughs> Not the, the, yeah. So that's the problem that for the first flight, it didn't follow the nominal plan and they needed to, to do an investigation report, basically a mishap investigation. Now, I've seen a lot of discussion whether, oh, have they asked about a modification of the license or anything like that? Just the fact that they're doing a report mishap and, and everything like that, it's already an indication that they have already asked to get that license modified for the second flight. I think that's a pretty strong indication because otherwise the FA will not move any gears to get this done. It will be like, okay, whatever, we're not right. It, it's, it's, right. it will be something that it will be completed on the, on the company side, but not on the FA side, which we've seen with other companies such as Astra, for example, they removed sort of the, the rocket 3.3 lineup. They're moving to rocket four and they basically are not going to get any launch license for Rocket 3.3 because they're not launching again. But they completed their own investigation, their own mishap and things like that. So this is this is the same thing where if you see them doing this stuff with the FAA and, you know, putting all of these sort of paperwork, they're, they've already asked, most likely. The problem here is that we don't know the, the dates. We don't know the timelines. It's something that we're not privy of. It, it's, it's something that completely goes just between SpaceX and the FAA. And if you ask them, they're going to say, yeah, we're doing it, but we cannot say what sort of timeline we are on because, yeah, that's, that's how it works, thing. basically. Yeah, yeah. And, and, it's, and because it's a commercial provider, you know, a lot there's protections there for trade secrets and, and whatever. Mm -hmm. And you, can, you could argue that a lot of what they're putting together for their report as a trade secret, so it may not be accessible even if you do a freedom of information request. So we just don't know until we know, I guess. But I, I would imagine, you know, given all the work that SpaceX had to do uh, in the course of time between the last launch and now, is they had to rebuild the pad, they had to put in that water deluge system, they had to change the hot staging on the rocket. Ryan, when, when do you think this thing's going up? It I looks think like making progress. That, <laughs> yeah, I think mid-September is really, you know, I think that's where the money should be at. I would also like to throw in that we've sent some provisional not Mars notice to mariners telling them, hey, there might be something over the Gulf of Mexico and Hawaii hey. between September 8th and September 13th, I believe, or September 23rd, yeah. one of the two. So September 13th, yeah. September 13th. Thank, thanks, Alex. So, you know, the the the... They, they don't, you know, license the launch. It's the FAA who licensed the launch. So the FAA's word is going to be most critical over anybody else's. However, it is interesting to see that hazardous operations, rocket launching, could be happening over the skies of Hawaii and the Gulf of Mexico next week. <laughs> so yeah, we'll I recognize those because those were screenshots that I took from my emails. That's a <laughs> service that the National Spatial Intelligence agency or something like that uh since you can set up those email alerts and things like that so i have those yeah and basically Maybe we you don't can... want to be in those coordinates at the time exactly. <laughs> this thing is coming back down it's up to you not to not to fall into those areas because they're probably not monitoring such a huge uh swath of the sea so um yeah so this is definitely a big rocket and it's coming back down uh one way or the other so keep an eye out on that Hey, we're looking at some of these tiles here, Alex, and, and these are very, are these similar to the Space Shuttle heat shield tiles? In some sense, yes, but in some sense, no, they are a derivative. I believe uh, it's called Tough Rock is the sort of acronym. I'm not fully sure though. Uh, yeah, the, the tiles are some sort of derivative. They were um, mostly sort of evolved for I think the X-37B, and they are also here now as well on Starship. But apart from that, I just don't fully know a lot because this is, at the end of the day, very uh, proprietary materials here. Mm -hmm. Right. It's all SpaceX derived, so we're not going to know too much about it. And, and Ryan, do these things get applied by hand? It looks like it might take a while to get these attached. 
yeah, so they're they're all stuck on. Uh, you'll see cranes uh, with with people on top moving around the ship um, in in various locations, like out in the rocket garden, in the in the, in the high bays. Um, I think we may we've also seen tile work at the launch site before, not whilst it's stacked atop a booster, but whilst it's you know just been sat on the out, on the concrete out at the launch site, just uh, uh, a few meters away from the tower here. So yeah, this is a this is a um, a, a hand-mounted process for each of those tiles stuck onto the belly of the starship, which is a pretty tedious process. Yes, and and, I'll, and the good news, at least at least for insofar as their planning is concerned, is that this, of course, will be a reusable ship. So the the labor that you put in initially will eventually have some ROI because you can launch uh, multiple times, and and they hope actually mm -hmm. sometimes on the same day once things get going. And Alex, when when this thing does launch. Um, they're not getting this one back, right? They're just trying to get to orbit at this point. Yeah, so pretty much just like the first flight, we don't think it's going to be... Um, like the nominal plan will call for both vehicles to go into the drink. And for the ship, probably if it even gets to Hawaii and survives the re-entry or anything like it, it will probably just do, you know, that belly flop thing that they were going to do for the first flight which was basically just impact the water at terminal velocity and for the booster the plan is called for the booster to simulate a landing on the ocean but even afterwards the basically the uh, how to say it they will try to get rid of it in any sort of way even if it was intact I'm so trying to go destroyed. around the algorithm here. <laughs> yeah. They will scuttle yeah. it, as they say. E e exactly. <laughs> and that's right, because you, you have a lot of proprietary stuff that might be quite interesting to competitors and other nations and everyone else, especially because uh, maybe, you, you, you know what, maybe we should go out there with a boat and get one of those tiles, and then we can answer the question as to how they are put together. <laughs> so there's there's lots of interest in this uh, vehicle. So, hey, we got some more Super Chats to thank. Uh, Bidford with a $25 Super Chat. Loves, loves, loves Starbase. Money for bacon and bug spray for all in Boca Chica. And bug spray is definitely something needed at all of these launch locations. I can attest to uh, being eaten alive over there at Cape, uh, the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, John Fez is a new Pat, Pad Rat member. Thank you very much. Uh, Grisu19840 upgraded to launch director. Congratulations and thank you for wow. your upgrade. And that's a, a big, uh, big thank you to you for doing that. And we have uh, Daniel Hogbin here who gifted five red team memberships. What's great cool. about our community is that if you hang out in the chat long enough, you too will become a member because other members are very generous in gifting these memberships out. And William Stout also became a red team member here. So let's, uh, we got time for more questions, I guess, guys, right? Because we're still waiting for something to move. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I saw some guy taking a picture from there. Maybe some oh, yeah. final janks. I'm seeing we, still some people around. If we see people around, that's not a good sign that we're going up very quickly, right? Yeah. But it doesn't necessarily mean that it's not going to be like, oh, it's going to be two hours or three hours from now. Mm -hmm. I can still get away within five, ten minutes or so. So, like, no, no big deal. <laughs> Just because right. there's people around. It's not... Yeah, it's not reason to panic. And, and Ryan, th this this rocket obviously isn't fueled, so you don't have to worry about any kind of explosive issues necessarily. Um, but you you don't want to be probably within the range in, in which it might tip over. So that's probably the distance, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, when we see fully fueled t uh, tests, the village residents at Boca Chica get a what's called an overpressure notice through their letterboxes. So they are all made aware that uh, a big explosion could potentially happen, and, and that can only you know really happen when it when it's fully fueled because you know methane and oxygen they go together and they and they and they combust, especially when put through the reactors. So you know that's if if anything goes wrong with that, you want to make sure you're very very far away from the rocket. And right, we're seeing some evidence of of the power of those rockets when they are fueled from the dents that are in those uh, on those tanks next to the pad, right? So that there's a uh... yeah. Definitely, and I, I think it's important to note that you see those those shells there. They are they mm -hmm. those aren't the actual tanks themselves. Okay. I believe for the majority of them, they are they are shells over the tanks. Got so it. you see dents. That's not a dented tank. The inside tank structure is probably okay. 
If not, they would have repaired them. Those are, I believe they are 12 meter diameter shells over the top of nine meter diameter tanks. So they have one and a half meters, roughly, give or take, all the way around each of those uh, GSE tanks. There's one exception. The one on the sort of the of the two damaged ones, the one on the right, it's actually the tank itself because it doesn't have anything Is inside. Is that the water tank? Exactly. Yeah, that's the water tank, which is not being used anyways. Like they were not using it either way. So you see it, it it's actually more dented than the other one. The other one does have an inner shell in sort of that that other tank it is for water. But the water is like inside of the inner shell, so they don't care. They still pulled out a little bit of the dents, but not fully. And I have a question here from uh, Launch Recap. Um, was the hot ring the hot ring just added on top, or did it replace an existing ring? Added on top. So it's a it's an it adds a little bit more height to the rocket, then, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Oh, there you it's go. Its own, it is. Yeah, it's its own little structure there. You can see from the bottom of the vents to the top, it's its own little structure there with uh, with things in start inside as well. It's but essentially just bolted on top of the booster there before it uh, rolled out to the pad. You can see here the great sort of humans for scale picture here because you have a guy on his phone on the top dome, <laughs> that shield dome that they have for the for the raptors, and then another guy with his head out, out of one of the vents for the for the raptors. You can see how thick and like how wide those vents are. And yeah, they're they're no joke. <laughs> Gives you a and sense it's of take scale. A, a lot of temperature when those engines light up too, so it's uh, it's mm -hmm. got to be. It, this is steel. Yeah, this is this is pretty much the same the same material as the rest of the vehicle, and you can see here. So you see those just little knobs on the top of the of the ring. It, it, there are like three: one here in the foreground, and like two mm -hmm. on the left, and and the and the right on the on the background. Those are. Basically, the same pins where the ship is attached to. They have like a hook in the middle. You can kind of see it on 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 the one on the on the foreground there, mm -hmm. in the middle. That that's basically what it hooks to the to the ship. Prior to the first flight, a lot of people were like, "Ah, oh, those that that is incapable of holding both the vehicles. Those are gonna break." Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think probably those loopy loops in the air, or as Das said, uh, doing a Kerbal. Um, I think that demonstrated those little pins actually hold the vehicles together very, very well. <laughs> and I would imagine they, they probably designed it for, <laughs> for that purpose, and we'll, we'll certainly find out how well it holds when uh, this finally lifts off. And this question I can uh, toss over to uh, Ryan from Mark. Um, is this launch profile any different from the first attempt, or is it going to be the same as it was before? Based on the provision or not Mars we've seen, and also I believe based on what Elon has said in previous Twitter spaces, the launch trajectory is going to be pretty much as close as possible to the attempted trajectory, shall I say, shall I say, for IFT-1. So it's going to be pretty much the same idea. Launch out of Boca, not make an entire orbit, do a ballistic trajectory all the way around the Earth, and then, fingers crossed, make it to entry interface just off the coast of Hawaii with Ship 25, if the launch does make it that far. And you say if. What's the over-under on uh, success, do you think, at this point? I, I feel like they've learned a lot. I, I, it seems to me that the biggest problem they had, which was beyond the pad basically getting destroyed, was the fact that uh, the Raptors did not stay lit. They lost a bunch of engines uh, on liftoff. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the chances of these Raptors staying lit? We saw during the uh, static firing test that they got most of them lit at half thrust, but a couple of them yeah. failed. Is that going to be an ongoing problem? Well, I think, in my opinion, the, the move for the booster from hydraulic thrust vector control to electrical thrust vector control, that removed the need for a hydraulic power unit, I believe which means that, fingers crossed, the Raptors should be a little bit more reliable because, in my opinion, looking at the footage from the first flight, it looked as if there was a little bit of a problem with the hydraulic power unit. It kind of spat out some stuff, <laughs> as it were, <laughs> and uh, I believe that the Raptors probably could have been uh, impacted negatively because of that. So this move to electric thrust vector control, which was already in the plans way before IFT-1, I think that could definitely help with 
the um, the reliability at least from from some of those Raptors. I think, you know, we saw in the static fire, the most recent static fire, they still lost two engines, right? right. I think losing engines is to be expected and elon has said himself the uh, the point of having so many engines is for that redundancy you can lose three engines and the vehicle will still keep going if you lost three engines on the saturn 5's first stage for example it probably wouldn't keep going because it only had five so right. by increasing your number of engines you have more redundancy because you have more engines so that was I, kind I, of the, 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 that's my take on it anyway that was the design philosophy around Falcon 9, that having nine engines was better than three. So you, you had some margin for error. You certainly needed most of them lit at the beginning of, of the launch, but but as you made your way up, you don't you didn't need as much. So um, we'll see. I guess it's one of those uh, mysteries that we will we will have answered uh, very shortly. And I, I want to toss this next one to um, Alex from Tyler Kinney, a two dollar super chat, because um, we we touched on this a little bit. But how can the ring support S25's weight? Because it, it obviously doesn't have his, it has those those uh, vents in there is that going to be enough i guess we'll find out in a few minutes well um they tested a prototype of it uh at massey's they have these sort of um outlandish kind of place uh, uh a few miles away from starbase where they test things uh, mostly cryogenic proof tests they do there but they also do structural testing of things they have a structural test stand there and they tested the this this hot state not this particular one it was mm -hmm. another uh but it was basically the same design the same construction whatever right uh so you test that apart and it seemed to hold it was there for about two weeks or so we're not sure what was exactly done on it we saw what appeared to be one of the tests so it, it, it's very hard to see this test because it's like those ropes have like this sort of cap on top of the ring. They pull on some ropes and it's not a thing that you can see like in a second. It's sort of like before with a QD arm, for example. You need to stay, you know, looking at it, a time lapse or anything like it because it's very subtle. Mm -hmm. And so we only saw one test, but they, they may have done multiple tests with different loads. And one of the things that I usually say is that you shouldn't worry about taking the weight of ship 25. You actually should, in, in not even the max Q uh, force on the vehicle, because I see a lot of people, you know, talk, oh, max Q is the most dynamic pressure, but it's not the most force that that ring is going to see. Uh, if you actually do the math, the most force that it's going to see is actually near uh, stage separation when the, for, for one part, you have the booster accelerating the whole stack at three, three and a half g's right, right. so what it's gonna feel for that right. ring is the as the, exactly it's gonna feel as if the weight on top which is the ship is three three and a half times the normal weight and, and so it's gonna be a very very heavy load that it's gonna have near the that that point of stage separation so yeah that's actually you know three it's not just ship 25's weight but like three or three and a half times that weight. That's a lot wow. of weight. Yeah. Is the ship. Wow. Yeah. Just to give a quick number here, the ship is about thirteen hundred tons, uh, fully loaded. So multiply that by three, and, and you get what? Three thousand nine hundred. So basically four thousand. Wow. Four thousand so tons. So we shouldn't have to worry about anything on the ground here. Really, the test is when <laughs> when it's under three Gs or more, uh, fully mm. fueled when that happens. And then on top of all that, we're lighting rocket engines, Raptors on the on the on that uh, on Starship 25, and uh, that will provide even more <laughs> to uh, stress that out. So we'll have to see what condition that booster is in. And I'm I'm guessing they must have some telemetry that they can get to see how structurally sound the booster is following that. Mm separation but that's something we'll probably won't have uh, access to unfortunately we have a lot more support here so i'm just going to keep uh, popping up some super chats until we see some movement here um joseph coucher thank you very much for your 20 dollars super chat just wanted to show my support and thank everyone at nsf for covering these events and this team has been working hard they were up late last night so every little bit helps and we greatly appreciate support and the one challenge with these things ryan is that you never know when they're going to happen right yeah i yeah it's just things are incredibly hard to predict especially when you know there's no there's no person from spacex telling us hey we're going to snack it 
1 p.m. Right. today, you know? <laughs> that doesn't happen. We have to look at it and go, hmm, are they stacking at 9? No. Are they stacking at 10? No. Are they stacking at 11? No. And we do that basically all day, every day, all the time. So we can broadcast this live to to the to you all. So you know, this is we are we are we are guessing with some uh, as much strong estimation as we can. And you know, believe you know, you have to have somebody who's who's monitoring these cameras twenty four seven to look for this activity. Sometimes you have some ideas to when something might happen. You might hear some things from the area. We certainly know uh, over there in Texas when they close roads down for for rocket movement and and launches yeah. and and various things. But uh, really, it, it requires a, a dedicated staff here at NSF to just keep an eye on all this stuff and. All of us who uh, come on the stream, we're kind of like in the fire department. You get a you get a page and you're <laughs> and you're broadcasting. So that's how it works. We never know when, when something's going to happen. So we're we're here to uh, to serve, and we greatly uh, enjoy doing it. Uh, Jim Cavett has uh, contributed five bucks for Jack out in the field to get some more fluids in him because it's probably hot out there today. So thank you very much for your support. And uh, Roger S, five dollar super chat. Uh, back tomorrow for Sunrise Shot and Tours. Thank you very much for your support. And we have a new member here, Christopher Moreau. For, uh, he's becoming a Pad Rat member, so thank you for joining us. DS gifted five Red Team memberships to other watchers here today, so thank you very much for that. And Josh Howard is also a new Pad Rat member. And um, so I have a super chat here from Brian F. I know the answer to this question, Alex, but I'm going to put it up anyhow. So will this flight have sound suppression water or is SpaceX uh -huh. going to ignore basic rocket science again? I think I think we're going to have oh. some sound suppression water, right? <laughs> well, it's actually not a sound suppression system. Oh, it isn't. And we have the perfect video coming up <laughs> for this. Uh, hey. So, yeah, it, it is not a sound suppression system. Uh, that water is not there for, for suppressing the, the sound. And basic rocket science, well, you know what other rocket, big, big rocket that didn't have any sound suppression system? It is the Saturn V. Oh, yes, so that's right. you, you probably have heard that the Saturn V used water, yes, but it did not use it as a sound suppression system. It used it mostly for cooling because it's a big rocket, right? And it destroys everything in its path. But the sound suppression system is mostly to protect the vehicle rather than everything else. Everything else just need it's it's mostly already rated to support all the acoustics. What you need is precisely that cooling. You need that water to not let everything just melt in your way as those rocket engines ignite. You don't want that thing to be melted. And in this case, they have put a plate underneath the pad to precisely protect against the raptor's fury. And that water helps a lot in cooling down and it basically creates this protective layer on top. And yeah, that upcoming video also talks about those other traditional systems. Um, it is not a thing, it was not a thing for Saturn V. Actually, LC-39A and 39B only got a sound suppression system until the shuttle, but you'll see it. <laughs> so, so really, the, the test will determine whether it's enough or not. Uh, Brianna Matthews here asks um, a similar question. Um, do we expect the system to be fully completed before the launch attempt? I, I thought it was done, but I guess it isn't. It is done. Oh, um, right. We saw that during I'm, the test, right? I, I mean, they, they probably are talking perhaps about the... Because the, their tanks are not fully plugged in, but I believe the way that the system... like that They have this, this sort of tank farm, right? Uh, where, they, where they have the pressure tanks, and the water tanks, one of the water tanks is not plugged in yet. Uh, and some of the pressure tanks, I believe they are not plugged in either. But for now, it seems like what they have, it's okay for what they need for at least this upcoming flight. And we'll see, we'll, we'll, we'll see whether they actually fully install everything or what have you. But if they wanna launch soon, they might not wait around. Right, they may just try it with what they have and see if that that makes enough of a difference. And uh, Ryan, I'm looking at this shot here of the enormous tower and the enormous rocket next to the enormous booster. Um, when we last uh, all got together, at least for me, to uh, watch something happen here, we saw the booster getting lifted up. Uh, that, that spaceship, Starship, has to go up a lot higher. <laughs> so how high is it going to go? Yeah, so the booster, I believe, is about 70 meters tall. 
Um, I'm unsure. I, I got that number before they put this hot staging ring on top, so I imagine it's probably a, just somewhere in the ballpark of 70 meters. About if you think of a, of a Falcon 9, which is much bigger than most people think, one entire Falcon 9 is the size in terms of height of that super heavy booster. It's a little bit thinner, but in terms of height, it's the same. So if you imagine they've got a lift starship all the way the height of a Falcon 9, add on the height of the orbital launch mount, and then even higher in order to swing the starship across and then lower it on top of the booster. So it's a fair few 80, 90, just under 100 meters, I'd say, of height from the bottom of the starship in order to, you know, shift it across and put it on top of the booster. This is something that NASA does inside of the VAB, but here we've got it out in, in the clear air. Um, there's certainly some, some salt water <laughs> nearby as well. Uh, I, I would imagine they have to keep an eye on corrosion up there, Alex. I, I don't know if you know as much about the ground systems here as the oh. rockets, but I just... Well, they, they, they probably have to, but frankly, some of the... Uh, a, a lot of the things they have already covered, uh, that OLM, for example, used to be very naked. Uh, mm -hmm. It didn't have all of the protections that we see right now of those shields and everything. That was something that they added for the first flight. And frankly, that probably helps, uh, you know, with corrosion and, and things like that on all the important bits that they have inside it. Right. Well, we will continue to uh, keep uh, keep watch here to see if something happens. And in the meantime, I'll take a few more uh, chats that came in. Uh, conservative space nerd Alex says uh, no shaving required even if you lose. I'm not sure <laughs> what he's referring to, but we appreciate his support. Uh, well, we, we we have to mention. I guess we have to mention everything uh, uh, on, on every stream. Yeah, I have a bet. I bet uh, after the first flight that they will not launch again after uh, until at least after the summer ended, and the summer ends officially on September 23rd. And officially, we always say, okay, well. August 31st is the end of the summer, right? Um, but the official finish is September 23rd. And if they launch before that, then I cut my hair. Um, <laughs> so yeah, but I will not shave my hair. Like I'm not, I'm not approaching my hair with with any razor or anything like that. I'm cutting it old style, and that's it. <laughs> Got it. Well, you know, I bet you there's probably some interest in, in just watching it happen. So I have a I have a Floby here. You know what a Floby is? Hmm, not sure. It's the thing you hook up to your vacuum cleaner and it does haircuts. It's great. So uh, oh, <laughs> I can send it your way. Yeah. Now I know what it is. Yeah. All right. Hey, we have some more uh, super chats to uh, acknowledge here. Um, Philip de Villiers uh, gave us a uh, $10.73 super chat. No comment, but thank you very much for your support. Alec picked up a mouse pad in the store and he wants to know if that mouse pad can withstand the force of him launching YouTube to watch the IFT2 stream. Ryan, do you think that mouse pad can handle it? Uh, if, uh, if, if you're using your eyes to watch, hopefully yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, guess, I, I guess, I don't know, you're vigorously moving your mouse at the time of launch, and I don't know. Just let go of everything and just, you know, embrace it in the glorious 1080p that we, that we cover on YouTube. Um, there you go. There you go, exactly. And you can find that mouse pad, by the way, at shop.nasaspaceflight.com. And uh, Alex, are you seeing a little bit of movement? Well, uh, as, I, as I just said on, on the back channels, frankly, I see movements everywhere right now. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's wishful it's, thinking. Maybe we want to see movement. Yeah, this is the problem that when, when you have so many cameras, you're, you're looking at all of these things, all of these signs that maybe this thing has moved or this other thing, right? Like right now there, it's like, is there really a gap there or is just like the normal gap that, that you know, you should expect because the vehicle is, is clamped and everything, right? Right. right. Uh, but is, is it that way how it looks like when it is clamped to the to the stand? Like that little gap there? I'm not sure. I don't know. Hey, can you uh, hear me? It's really hard. I can oh. hear you. From the field. Yeah, field. it's still it's still on the stand. I am hearing some creaks and groans from the chopsticks and the draw works. They're making a whole bunch of noise, so they're probably just taking up the weight of the ship. There's yeah. also a drone up just under the QD arm on the south oh, side. Oh yeah. So uh, yeah, it seems like we're getting into the, getting into things here. And how you doing out there, Jack? Are you keeping uh, hydrated? Yeah, I'm plenty hydrated, but I forgot my hat, so I'm gonna look like a tomato. Tomorrow. <laughs> oh no, <laughs> get that man some sunscreen. We have a lot of support here in the chat and everyone is appreciating the, uh, the work that you're doing for us out there and definitely uh, pipe back in when, when we've got some uh, movement going on. 
And I will say, it is good that we have no Jedi watching, because I could imagine a lot of Jedi just trying to get this thing moving, you know, just with the power of the Force, right? Um, also, did you say you had a Floby? That's not do, real, right? You're joking? No, I do have one. I was going to use it on my YouTube channel, and I, I ended up uh, having another alternative <laughs> for cutting my hair, but I do have one. That's amazing. It was going to be a, an event, but uh, thankfully I found a, uh, a, hair, a hair person that does house calls, so I was able to uh, get my hair cut during the, <laughs> during the pandemic when they shut down all the barber shops around here. Uh, but uh, yeah, I was ready to go, and I still have it, so it might be a fun... Uh, maybe we'll, we'll try it when, uh, oh, when we all oh. get together. Oh, it is definitely lifting. Yes. Look at that. There is movement. So I was not imagining things. They, they actually were, and as Jack mentioned in the field, uh, he was hearing those groans and, and creaking noises. So that was definitely the chopsticks starting to carry the weight. Yeah. It's moving pretty, it's moving a little faster than I thought it would. <laughs> yep. And Alex, I would imagine that this will be moving at varying speeds as they go up, right? I'm guessing there's there's more risk at certain points of the lift versus others, or maybe they'll get it up here, see if it can support the weight, and then go forward. Yeah, the the usually the stop at certain gateways, so to speak, like they have these or, or more like waypoints in the in their lift. Uh, the last time we saw a ship lift was was ship 24 lifted on booster seven, and that one. They lifted up a bit, they lifted then again, and then they moved to the OLM. Then again, they went up, and that's when they went all the way up, so to speak, right? Like, all the way higher than the than the booster. And as they go up, sometimes they slide left, right, left, right, depending on, on whatever the, their sensors uh, say is better. And, yeah, once it is at Apogee, then they swing over the... The, the booster. <laughs> Very cool. And we'll just kind of wait here and see what happens. And am I still hearing, Ryan, a, a little uh, alarm in the background? I guess that they just ring that constantly while they're moving? I guess so. That klaxon thing keeps just going on and going on and going on, just making sure everyone's aware that there's some stuff going on. And the gap seems to have stopped growing now, so the gap is mm. pretty solid. They've stopped bringing the ship up, so... Uh, I guess this is just final checkouts before they go the rest of the way, making sure that they've got the ship on the chopsticks, they're fully supporting it um, before they take it up. As I was talking about before, probably just shy of 100 meters above the ground in order to, to, to stack this atop booster 9. And I'm guessing, Brian, they probably learn things uh, each time they do this, and they've done it a lot, but but I'm guessing this, is, this one is certainly going to be a little bit different given the ring up there, but um, have you noticed any variation in, in their procedures over time? Over time, it's, gen it's generally... Oh, put my teeth back in. It's generally seemed like the, the stacking operations get quicker and quicker and quicker with every time. I mean, the, you know, the first time they stacked it, they didn't even have the chopsticks there. They used a massive crane in order to stack uh, Ship 20 atop Booster 4 back in those days, if you remember. So the the stacking operations has definitely got quicker with the introduction of the chopsticks. And then as they use the chopsticks more and more to lift boosters and ships, they get even more experience with them. And, and then they know, you know, I guess they'll learn all the little snags and things they have to work out every time with the chopsticks as they lift the ships and the boosters. So, you know, each time we see an incremental speed up roughly on average with each, with each lift that they end up doing for the boosters and ships here. You know, I'm seeing a lot of anticipation here in the chat as uh, not only for the lift here, but also just the, the launch that's going to take place. And you know what? I've got a special announcement on that topic. If you're hyped for this launch, you're going to be really hyped for something else that we've got cooking. And that is the Starship Flight 2 patch. That is uh, specifically for orbital flight number one or two, depending on how you're counting. This is a new design. This is instead of the purple design of patch one, we now have a green and orange design for the second flight of Starship. Design still has the hexagonal design of the first patch, but with new touches. So you can add it to your patch collection. I've got a patch collection up here on the wall next to me. It's available on pillows, shirts, mugs, and even water bottles for the kids and the adults alike. My kids love their water bottles, so maybe I'll get one of those for them. Uh, the patch is limited, and at some point we're going to run out. So you got to, you know, you got to, got to, got to jump. You got to move. 
Uh, there's no shipping delay. The patch is in the warehouse. They are ready to go in the coming days if you order today. And we're selling it right this minute. So you can go to shop.nasaspaceflight.com and find your patch there. And we also have a limited amount of the first patch available for grabs uh, as long as they last. You know, it's one of those supplies uh, we'll, we'll, where we got them until the supplies run out. And this is designed by Paul Lean, and you can see uh, how this looks on the shirt, on the patch itself, on the water bottles. You can go and uh, browse all the different variations we've got. And again, in stock and ready to move. So if you are excited for this launch, you get an awesome uh, merch here in the store. And this also supports the efforts here at NSF. So it's a win-win. You get something and, and we can keep operating. So check it out. We also have all of the other stuff in the store as well. That patch looks really cool. I like it. Yeah. And if you're uh, a I member, also... you can use the emoji for the patch in chat if you're a Ooh. member. So. And we've already <laughs> sold one. Look at that. Someone's All already right. bought the sticker version of it. <laughs> I'd also like to point out, if you look at that patch, right, we haven't just, you know, we haven't printed out a sticker and stuck it on a patch for you to sew into things. That's a fully embroidered patch. We've done this properly. It's a very high quality design as the ship continues to lift up here at much quicker than it was before. And I heard if you buy more patches, it moves quicker. There you go. Keep, yeah, there you go, everybody. <laughs> buy the patches and SpaceX will keep going the right. quicker. Clean us out, and, we'll, and we guarantee that this rocket will get stacked. And it's, by the way, it's threaded everywhere on the patch. It's got a fancy edge wrap. It is really, really nice. And it's a lot nicer than the stuff you'll find, like, you know, at some of these unnamed places online. <laughs> so it's, it's high quality. We don't skimp on the quality. So it looks like uh, a lot of people are heading over to the store right now to check it out. So that is awesome. And on the store note, I want to thank uh, Brent Norman here with a super chat of uh, 1399 Canadian. I need some more wall space for the new metal print of the Booster 9 S25 on launch. Yep, you'll, you can put that right next to your patch. It goes, it goes together. You can, you can accessorize. So up <laughs> it goes. So we had a lot of movement. It looks like it just slowed down there a little bit, Alex. Yeah, it, it, it normally does that. Um, as I mentioned before, it sort of like goes up, then it rotates, and then it's it, it, it's kind of like a waypoint kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know how when they go to the ISS, they have these waypoints where they usually stop or like they, they go through checks before going through them to ensure that the vehicles are, you know, in the right position, things like that. This kind of seems to go in, in a similar way. In a, in a very similar fashion where they stop at certain points to check things. They stop maybe for like less than a minute or just a minute or two and see right now it is lifting again uh, after stopping. Uh, it's very, very slowly as you can see, yeah. but it's still uh, lifting up. And yeah, it's, it's a very careful thing that they have to do here because it's 50 meters tall, it's nine yeah. meters wide. Right, this is not, uh, I, I don't know the, the Imperial for that. I'm, I'm really sorry about that. But yeah, it's big. It's a very big object. And so you're right. moving it very, very slowly because it is a very delicate thing. One thing that, that really struck me when I first started covering space stuff about a decade ago was just how big everything really is. Like you see this stuff on, on the stream today or on television and it looks big, but you don't realize how big until you're you're standing next to one of these things. It's just uh, it's crazy. Looks like we're making some good time here. And then Ryan, as it as it goes up, right now it is next to the booster. It has to go on top of it. So do these chopsticks turn when it gets above? Yeah. So when the Starship has a, a relatively good clearance, I'd say maybe two, three meters, maybe more clearance between the uh, top of the booster and the bottom of the ship. The chopsticks will stop moving up and then they will swivel across in tandem with one another and then that will move the starship across to the top of the booster and then they'll very slowly stack it on top by lowering the chopsticks down and it's going to be even more delicate i would imagine for this first lift with the hot staging ring which is that that kind of uh, uh grated ring you can see on top of the booster there that is kind of the the, the key point, I would argue, going into the next fight of Starship, one of the things that didn't work was staging of the ship and the booster during IFT-1. For IFT-2, SpaceX are trying to resolve that issue by changing the staging method altogether instead of trying to, you know, flip the ship well, off of the booster, literally. Hot staging is the way to go. Alex is now going to argue with me and tell me that I'm entirely wrong. But I think, in my opinion, staging <laughs> is really important. You know, the... 
they need to be able to get the ship off the booster at the end of the day. So I think staging, in my opinion, is, you know, the big thing ahead of the next launch. I will say, um, I don't think staging was a big deal on the first flight because it didn't get to that point. Um, I do believe, though, that the, that the method that we're going to try with the whole flip and everything was very silly, in my opinion. Um, it they, they had all this, this cool thing of like, well, we don't need any pushers or anything like that. But at the end of the day, it's it's like, look, it, 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 it was silly because you have all of the ships and boosters flipping and everything that wastes a lot of time and a lot of performance. You can see that S25 there on the uh, side of, of uh, Starship. It, so this is the 25th. Look at that. Room. That's really cool. <laughs> It's funny it's how small bonkers. it looks, but this is like, this is big. <laughs> yeah. Whenever they, they do these things and we have this view, it's like, it's bonkers. Like, how is it even <laughs> in that place? It's, it's like hanging there. Keeps going. And, uh, <laughs> and Ryan, as I, as I watch this, it almost, it, I know this is not where it's resting, but it almost looks like those, uh, you know, those, those two uh, uh, Pins on the side of the rocket there are, are what's resting on the chopsticks, but that is not the case, right? There's something that it actually rests on. Yeah, so those forward flaps you can see, that is not what is being lifted up. And it's also the same for the grid fins on the booster. You can see here on the on the close-up shot, there is a gap there. There are specific pins on the side of the ship under the flaps that the chopsticks latch onto before they lift and uh, it's also used for stabilization and things like that i believe they have stabilizer pins below as well from the chopsticks that they use to kind of swivel forward and back left and right so they can keep it upright and straight as they as they head up to the top of the booster um but no the, the flaps are not what is supporting starship here unlike many of the early conceptual renders we've seen we're like oh they're gonna land on the grid fins no right. they're gonna use pins yeah. below the grid fins and below the flaps yeah we we usually got a question of like are they lifting the booster with the grid fins? And it's like, no, they have these two little uh, knobs kind of thing, right? That, that stick out from the top of the booster. In the case of the ship, it's the opposite. The chopsticks have the knobs or, or like the pins and they go in like little holes underneath the, the, the basically the, 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 the forward flaps. But for example, if this were the HLS prototype, HLS doesn't have any flaps, right? So right. it doesn't have any problems because it still will have those little holes for the pins to go in and no problem but like yeah there's there's nothing bad about about that and hls is the what the human landing system for the moon mission mm -hmm. is that the right acronym there's a lot of yep. uh, acronyms in in space as we all know mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but it's good to keep up with uh, with all of that and you know what speaking of uh you know the different uses of starship um luke here has a question that I know Chris B is going to love. How does Starship compare to the shuttle in terms of cargo and crew capacity? I guess it's significantly greater, right, Ryan? Yeah. So if you think of the if you think of the shuttle, it had a payload bay the size of a school bus, and it uh, realistically the most amount of people that ever sat was seven. So if you look at Starship, early renders have shown hundred people maybe inside of a Starship. And then that payload bay door, that chomper design we've talked about before, that conceptual design, if that opens up, you can fit a lot of stuff inside of that ship. Remember, this is 50 meters tall. This is nine meters in diameter. That's a lot of volume you can get, even in the even in the top half of the ship with the tanks. You know, we see this lifting up now to stack a top booster nine. Remember, that's 50 meters tall, nine meters wide, stainless steel. It's a massive, massive vehicle. You can fit a lot of stuff in there. This would this would dwarf the shuttle uh, in terms of in terms of its size alone. Let alone thinking of of crew count or or payload count. I read something the other day that they're, they're looking at one option for, because it's, it's almost like an empty, uh, almost a template starship in, in that you have your engines at the bottom and everything else in between <laughs> the tanks yeah. you can you can vary. And, and there's some talk of actually making starship into a space station. Is that something I heard correctly, Alex? Yeah, so they have this little thing going on, uh, a proposal. They have these no exchange funds kind of agreement with, with NASA, Space Act agreement it's called. And under that, they're proposing a, a, a sort of system of using both Dragon and Starship to create uh, uh, basically an orbital station in low Earth orbit. And this will use both Dragon and Starship, but mostly Dragon, Dragon is already developed. That thing is, is proven, like the, the other day they just landed uh, a new crew from the ISS, right? Um, 
But a starship is new, so they have like this long list of milestones that they need to go through before even getting to uh, what is called, I think it is a like key decision point, whatever, right? It's one of these last things mm -hmm. be before you start building the the station, and that's that that's the schedule on on the document. It says Q3 2028 or something, so it's right, right. many years down the line. But obviously, they need all of these milestones to be completed of course right yeah it takes a lot there's a lot going on they have to get this thing into orbit first before you can dock anything to it so it'll take a little bit of time it kind of reminded me of of skylab right where you had kind of the internal tank of a of a former rocket that turned into a into a space station so it's uh anything's possible but we have to uh get to orbit and the first step to orbit is lifting the starship on top of the booster <laughs> which is what we're seeing here and this is um s25 ryan is this the 25th Starship that's been created, or they've had some. <laughs> yeah, here we go. The rabbit hole has opened up. It's flung open. Here we go, ladies and gents. <laughs> so, oh, it really depends where you want to start from. We've seen starships with Mark designations MK1, MK2, Mark 1, Mark 2. We've seen starships with SN. Uh, with SN designations, with start, with since Starship with S de designations, yeah, right. it's a real mess. And uh, mess also, we've seen, the, we've seen the chopsticks stop moving here as well with right. Ship Twenty Five. Yeah, I wanted to break in and just mention that we believe this. Your video is not paused. We are stopped. Alex, is this one of those milestones, or do you think they're trying to check something? Yeah, just like we talked about before, they have these sort of gateways uh, or waypoints, whatever you want to call them. Points on the left where they just stop for a few minutes uh, might be longer, might be shorter. It depends on the side of the lift, but this is usual. This is normal. Uh, they are just stopped to check things, and that's pretty much what we expect. Uh, one of one of the times when they were lifting them, um, and I guess this is why it is a good place to stop. Uh, when they were sort of in this position. Uh, they had a, uh, a piece of cable dangling from Ship 24. It was one of the last lifts of Ship 24. Not the very last, but one of the last. And they have this little wire dangling from the bottom. And they needed to, to lower it again in order to remove it. Because otherwise <laughs> it will not be able to, to be stacked on, on the booster. But that's probably why they do these things, right? Where, where they stop at a certain point and they check not only the chopsticks and the vehicles and everything, but also, in general, you know, all of the systems uh, joined together. All right. Well, you know what we're going to do here, Brian. I, 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 I cut you off, or uh, right where we cut ourselves off <laughs> as it was going up here. Uh, Jimmy, think you want to finish up on on the S25 before I get to some supporter messages because we have a ton of them. There's patches going left and right, and everyone's leaving a message. <laughs> yeah. Um. I'll just I'll just wrap up what I was saying, which was basically with Sin Mark designations, with Sin SN designations, which kind of continued to the S designation. So this is S25. We saw you know SN1, SN2, SN3. We've also seen some test tanks, test articles which is like SN number 0.1, SN number 0.2. So calling this the 25th Starship is really difficult because there's so many different things that have been given a specific designation that you can't work re you can't really officially work out what's a Starship, what isn't. Is a test tank a Starship? It has an SN designation, but it's not a full ship. So the, it, we dive into a whole a whole number of different things that we need to work out. So it's really hard to tell, just be like, oh, it's S25, it's a 25th ship. It's probably not. Looks like we've got yeah. movement again, so uh, that's good. Hey, we were trying See? to figure out if we're going to have a sixteen-hour stream today or not. So it looks like uh, <laughs> we're, we're moving, <laughs> moving in a positive direction here. Just as foretold, the elders said <laughs> they were going to move it. <laughs> uh, speaking of which, just just before we we move on, because I wanted to plug in here, we have next to space flight, uh, the Starship. Uh, page basically lists all of the vehicles that have had any sort of relationship with testing and flight uh, heritage or anything like it so i'm gonna plug that in on chat and you can check there the list of vehicles it is a long one from star hopper starship mk1 all the way to these vehicles that we see here on screen ship 25 and booster 9 even future vehicles such as ship 28. i'm going to add that to my bookmark list because that's a really helpful link there so 
Um, all right, let me get to uh, some of our supporters here because we've got a ton. Those those patches are, are going fast. So uh, get your get your orders in. <laughs> leave a store message, and we'll we'll try to acknowledge it here as we go. Uh, Methane Man wants to see some pictures of the bottom of the hot stage ring, and I think we'll probably see that as we get close to joining here. Although we've got a little bit here going on, so uh, the team will certainly help you out as we make our way through here. And thank you very much for your support. Uh, Christopher Moreau, a new member in France, lifelong fan of NFS Global Aerospace Community. Thank you very much for your support today. We appreciate it. Jeff Rowe, one Red Team membership gift. Thank you very much for supporting us and uh, gifting a membership to a team. Mike Elders is a new Red Team member. Uh, Andy Law with 10 Red Team membership gifts. Thank you very much for that. Rachel Turner became a Red Team member and Jean Pierre LaRoche became a PadRat member. And we have Robert Reeson here as well. And um, here's a question from Johnny Nielsen. I think this one's uh, just going to get us fired up here. Can't we agree that the Starship launch being the ultimate pipe dream of all times? But we have seen one, right? So multiple ones. And uh, I think you know, I'm, I'm pretty confident this one's going to do better than the last one. What do you think, Ryan? I think I this think is going to go. Is that a pun? Could it could be. That's a fine. <laughs> I we think have an emoji the, for that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think, hopefully, that the ship's going to get further than it has so far, because it appears to have stopped again during the flight. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I really want it to get past staging. As I said before, staging is my kind of thing, you know. I, wanna, I want hot staging to work so bad, because it'll look real cool. So, you know, staging, I think, and any, any, oh. any further, you know, that's what I want. Speaking of staging, look at those uh, beautiful raptors uh, side of the starship there. And Alex, these are different size nozzles depending on where it is in the atmosphere. Is that right? Yeah. So the inner three are the sea level uh, raptors. It is not that they are not like they, they. It's it's not that they do not work in the vacuum of space. It's just they are not uh, optimized for use in space. That's what the big bells are for on the other three, which are the vacuum uh, optimized raptors, the RVAX. Um, it's interesting because I'm seeing things here. Uh, there appears to be some kind of hardware on the Raptor vacuum engines. Um, you can kind of see it on the ends of the two on the on the foreground, like left and right, and the center one. You see like some sort of plate-looking kind it's of like thing. Like a little tab thing hanging off mm, the side. Yeah. Yeah. And I wonder, um, just wondering very out loud here, um, it kind of reminds me of a system that the Merlin engines have to avoid contact, or more like whenever there's a contact, uh, they, you know, they bump into each other. They have, they have like uh, basically a, a bumper uh, on on each of the of the engines, so that if they contact each other, that sort of dampens the the impact uh, with each other. Obviously, the RVACs do not move, but the center engines do gimbal. And so, I'm not fully sure what is the reason for this kind of plate. That's the, the first thing that came to my mind, though. Um, might not be, though. Like, this is the first time we see it. Probably something that we have to, to think about after. Cause obviously, the first time you see a new change, anything new. Lots of things go through through one's minds, right? And it's lifting again, as we can see here. Or less, is, is the camera moving? I don't think it's the camera moving. But yeah, yeah it is I something that we have up. to. Yeah it, is. yeah, it is definitely something that we have to to you know think about long enough. <laughs> and I want to thank. Uh, we have a hundred dollar super chat that just came in here. Let me see if I can get it up on screen here. Our system is. Uh, there it goes. Uh, for Russell Snodgrass, $100 Super Chat. Thank you very, very much for your support. Nice day to enjoy a BLT, a bacon launch tower sandwich, and wonderful live stream. Thanks for the coverage. Yeah, we've got uh, close to 16,000 people watching, and your support and the support of everyone watching is greatly appreciated. These camera views don't come from SpaceX. These are uh, NSF cameras that we have placed all over Starbase, and that is how we're able to provide this coverage to you. So all of the support uh, helps us monitor these cameras for when something is happening, but also keeps those cameras running too. And there's quite the team behind uh, making all this stuff work as you see it here. So thank you very, very much for your support. And again, thank everybody. And I'm just going to keep rolling through some things here. 
Um, and what we may end up doing, because we have so many, is uh, we may just uh, kind of run the ticker here as, uh, as we're going, because there's just so many support messages in here that yeah. we're going to have to get caught up on. The, ima the amount of store orders that we can see here with store messages coming through <laughs> is absolutely incredible. So many of you are picking up that brand new patch from Pauline. You can see it in the top right. That's the store messages. Every time you see a product slide through there, that's someone who's gone to shop.nasaspaceflight.com and bought a product off of there and those patches are selling very very fast so i mean in my opinion my advice would be if you want one it's probably best that you get one as soon as possible um because they are selling very very quickly yeah, and you can just see some of these store messages from everyone who uh <laughs> is picking them up they just love them so they're great i'm going to get one too as soon as i'm off duty here and then i'm going to leave the uh, shop.nasaspaceflight.com website up on my wife's computer as like a little yeah. hint for, uh, <laughs> for the holidays that are coming up, you know. I have a birthday coming up too, so maybe I can get a couple of uh, metal prints and some patches and some mugs, you name it. Hey, Jim Cavett here with a $5 super chat um, to uh, help Jack with the uh, the shade. So maybe that can uh, help Jack uh, get himself some uh, some sunscreen out there, keep things uh, from getting too uh, too burnt. Um, hey, question here from Raver Raviat um, with a $5 super chat. Uh, for Alex, these heat shields look sketchy. Do you think it will cause issues hmm. during descent? We'll find out, won't we? <laughs> well, if it gets to that point, right. then they'll probably worry about the heat shield. I think, um, in general, both Ship 24 and Ship 25, to me, are glorified nose cones. It's not, it's not that they don't have their own merits. They have actually introduced a number of upgrades to Ship 25 as well for, for this second flight compared to Ship 24. But... You know, that's in the off chance that it actually goes through its own flight, you know, its own powered flight and everything. Um, but at the end of the day, Booster 9's flight is the important one. Go through Max-Q again, actually with all of the engines hopefully running and all the way to stage separation. And then if the ship lights its engines and keeps going, that's a plus. That's that's extra stuff that that is nice to have. <laughs> we can see As there I look again. at these... At these tiles, I, I think about the space shuttle and how how they really struggled keeping them from popping off. Um, you wonder how these these will fare, especially because there's so many so many more. These look a little larger than the shuttle tiles do, so yeah. I guess we'll find out. And I know with the One shuttle, the... they had to they had to inject like uh, mm. some some waterproofing material to keep the moisture from building up, right? Yeah. Yeah, and I also just want to add quickly, uh, I was talking before about comparing the size of Starship to the shuttle. I've run the numbers, and the Starship external tank, the big, the big orange tank under the, under the shuttle, is uh, the, the height of that tank is smaller than the height of Starship, and the width of that tank is smaller than the width of Starship. So just the ship alone, just Ship 25, which we're watching lift on top of the booster today, is bigger than the tank. Of the space shuttle and just imagine the srbs and the shuttle stuck on top there that gives you a little bit of a sense of scale it's just slightly larger than the external tank i remember correctly it was somewhere around 40 something meters tall and 8.4 meters wide yeah but it's 46.9 meters tall oh my gosh chris if you're watching you, i mean that's that's a positive point right <laughs> yes. we can see <laughs> You can see there the the numbers now of the Raptors, <laughs> 126, I think it's what it says. Yeah, yeah. Looks like it. That's so cool. These are views you can't get, you know, anywhere anywhere else really, right? I mean, I certainly if you were around the uh, the Starbase area, but we think about some of the the goings on at uh, ULA or over at the uh, Cape Canaveral or Kennedy Space Center, you often don't get this kind of detail of. The mm. process of getting these rockets prepared, um, but here we've got such, such great views because the, the the launch pad is literally on the side of the road. <laughs> it's really it's really crazy. I saw some footage earlier. I couldn't believe it. I haven't been down there yet. Um, I'm looking forward to at some point. So uh, Alex, I got a trajectory question for you. Oh boy. Uh, um, this is uh, from uh, Bloodhound09, and certainly we're not launching anything today. Although Starship is lifting, it's not launching. Um, but when <laughs> it does. Is this something that uh, Bloodhound can see from Puerto Rico? I don't think so because it's going in a different direction, but maybe you have more insight than I do. The flight path is coming near Puerto Rico, but it is not It is not going to be at a moment in flight where the engines are running, the ones that, are, that we see right here on screen. 
and so it, it'll it'll be in in its coast phase. Obviously, this is you know this is assuming that that everything has gone right on the right. propulsive got, phase of the, the flight. to the point where it would be there, right? <laughs> exactly, right. Yeah. If if everything goes right on the propulsion, you know, on the propulsive phase of the flight, the part where it sort of goes near Puerto Rico, it is basically coasting. It is not doing anything, and it will be in pure daylight. So it will be it will be very very hard to see. Starship uh, during during flight. The only portions of the flight where you will be able to see it is either when it is firing the engines. Uh, even if it's daylight, you probably will see something. Maybe a little bit, you know, bright dot, small bright dot in the sky or something. Uh, and when it is crossing sort of the terminator of the of the Earth, like going to orbital sunset and orbital sunrise. Uh, but apart from that, you will not be able to see it because it's during daylight. Pretty right. much. Yeah. I'll tell you what, if you're in Texas, you're certainly going to see it, hear it, and feel it yep. <laughs> for sure. So uh, no question about that. And as we're going here, I'm just going to put up some more of our um, door messages here. Everyone's very happy with their patch purchases. And we have a request here for a jacket to uh, patch it, too. So, yeah, get get on it. You can get some, some stuff going there. You can never have enough patches, right? So mm. great support from all of our friends watching today. And we are making some progress here, which is great. So it's going to go almost all the way to the top, it looks like, before it, it moves over, Ryan. Yeah, so the tip of the starship may just eat uh, near the, the, near the bit of the tower that, that sticks out there um, in order to then get moved across uh, atop the booster. Because even though the bottom of the ship is fast approaching the top of the booster... You want some spacing there, just in case, in order to have plenty of clearance to swing it over and then lower it onto the hot stage ring. And also, I guess, the more space that SpaceX has between the top of the booster and the bottom of the ship, the more leeway it kind of gives them as they approach that hot staging ring to get ready to, to stack it on top of the booster. And after this stacking, um, we have a question here from Jamie that um, Alex might be able to handle. Let me make sure that... There it goes. Um, well, we have... Oh, she's... I meant to click a different one, but we can answer this one first. Um, was there going to be live video of Booster 9's soft water landing attempt? I would imagine they're going to have a ship somewhere out there monitoring things, right? Well, I will, I will expect them to try, at least. Um, I'm not sure if they're going to be able to fully do it, because um, it's hard. And it is also not landing on a barge out in the ocean, just like Falcon 9, where right. you can have some sort of you know communication system, aka Starlink, on the barge itself, but the, the booster itself does have a Starlink. Unlike Falcon 9, Falcon 9 doesn't have a Starlink. It's more like the ship does have the, the Starlink. In this case, with Starship, though, uh, with um, both the booster and the ship, both have Starlink uh, terminals on them, Star Starlink antennas. You can see multiple of them um, in their fuselage. So, might be something that they try, but again, you know, if, if they don't give us that, like, yeah, I, I I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be angry or anything like that if they struggle with that. Especially knowing what it entails to get video out of remote places, right? <clears throat> right? Yeah. So yeah. I I will not be against them, you know, struggling with with that kind of stuff. And and they're act and you know SpaceX has an active navy essentially, and they've got other missions to support too. So unless they've got a ship dedicated to this that can go out that far, we're, we're probably well, we'll see. Maybe somebody's got a yacht that might uh, <laughs> might get some video footage. I'm sure there'll be people out there looking. I don't think I want to get too close to the the landing zone <laughs> when that when that happens. And uh, Ryan, um, another question came in from Six in the field. Spring. We have Jack in the field. Oh, we have Jack in the field. Jack, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. What are we seeing? I just want to point out as we look at the underside of the ship here, the engine section, it looks so clean. It looks like they've done a lot of work to sort of tidy it up, clean things up, shield things. I don't recall 24 looking this nice in the engine area. This is this is a really nice view we're getting. Just it looks it looks like a real nice ship. Just wanted to throw that out there. And we have seen Ryan some improvements from from one iteration to the next, right? They do look cleaner, they look more, they look less of a test article and more of a actual spacecraft. Yeah, I mean, if you want to compare Ship 25 to, as I was saying before, Starship Mark 1, you know, Starship Mark 1 
less SpaceX and Soul looked a bit like, you know, tin foil wrapped around some cardboard. This looks like a proper spaceship that, you know, can carry stuff into space and be reused. This is a proper, you know, they're really refining the design process and construction process with the new Star Factory that's been built and, you know, the, the new mega bays for the boosters and, and, and things like that. And on that and, same note, um, I, I would like to add here that Ship 25 is largely on the same kind of configuration design as Ship 24. But it has been upgraded like we, we've seen them actually adding stuff and modifying stuff obviously it nothing is always set in stone they can add and, and move things here and there as we can see there with uh with the hot stage in green they can add things at will as long as it is capable right so while it is the same kind of similar design as ship 24 it it kind of looks much better uh in every sense of the word and future vehicles do even much, much better. Am I hearing some denting? Me too. I wonder what it is. Yeah. I'm gonna look at all the cameras. But look at that. And it's like whatever it was, just maybe some hydraulic venting. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not an expert in these areas. Um, Ryan, do we expect a wet dress rehearsal of this too? We saw a wet dress rehearsal with the last stack. If it was me in charge of launching this, I would probably want to send it through a wet dress rehearsal just to make sure everything's working ahead of launch day. An argument that I would believe for not going through a wet dress rehearsal could be like the first launch attempt for IFT-1. They could do a, a launch day launch attempt and if they're not ready to launch they could just convert it at the click of their fingers straight into a wet dress rehearsal right. for Starship and Booster. So I think a dedicated WDR would be wise, but I can also see the argument for not doing a dedicated WDR and just going ahead with a launch day. Because best case scenario, if everything works, you can launch the thing. You don't have to detank it. You don't have to wait another day for road closures, not Mars, no TAMs, in order to launch it. So if you can get everything done in one day, I mean, I can see an argument for that. And Alex, uh, Alan in our chat is asking, uh, how far do you think we are from a crew Starship flight? I would say pretty far oh because we still have to land this thing <laughs> in addition to getting it into orbit, right? Exactly, yeah. Let's let's get it first up in into space, uh, you know, into all of the desired stuff and milestones that they need to do. Then we'll we'll see about, you know, refueling. In. Oh. That's interesting. Yeah, well, that's one of the steps. The, the quick disconnect arm is moving in. Okay. But definitely, yeah, it's it's true that there's many, many things before even putting anyone on board. So it looks like we are at the maximum height here, and are we starting to see it rotating in? Potentially. Doesn't look like the chopsticks can really go that much further. Yeah. They still have a little bit of leeway there. But, there's a, yeah. yeah, there's a little bit of room, but I'd also imagine they don't want to take the, the, the chopsticks right up to the top of the tower. Why not? You know, lifts aren't designed to be taken all the way to the top of the elevator shaft. You know, there's much, there's a lot of, uh, of leeway at the top of an elevator shaft. So I'd imagine it's kind of the same process for the chopsticks uh, with the draw works and everything at the bottom. You can see there the drone on the left next to the to the booster. I imagine that they're going to be taking a close look at that hot staging ring, those pins that the connections align, because this, this is the first time that they stack, and I'm not too concerned about the structural integrity of the ring. Again, we've seen it being tested multiple times, probably uh, the not this one, but the prototype one. To me, at least, it is that they have added an extra ring, right? And that changes where the chopsticks need to be for positioning the ship on top of the booster. And so overall, they probably have to pay close attention of where they put things. And we saw with Ship 24, they actually had a bit of an oopsie at one point where the ship was not placed correctly on the booster. And that was with the old design, without the hot staging ring. So definitely something that, that is needed every, every single time that you change something like this. You see there that tiny speck next next to the yep, to the booster. Up there. And that's footage we will probably never see. 
Yeah. This is for engineering benefit, not for uh, us at home. Yeah. And, uh, well, it depends. Sometimes they release some cool drone footage on their on their Twitter page true. with videos and photos and such. But yeah, as you said, this is primarily for engineering purposes. And to be honest, the the the, the, the majority of the reasons we have p cameras at launch pads is for engineering reasons, you know. Uh, even the cameras we saw for SLS's launch for Artemis 1, they had the engineering camera numbers, you know, burnt into the footage because they're engineering cameras. They're not designed for our viewing pleasure, even if they do a good job of that as well. We're getting close to the point where I think we might start seeing some Is it movement rotating toward... already? Might be a little bit there. It's hard to see. Yeah, it's rotating. Slowly sliding across here. Again, the, the, we're very zoomed in now, so any right. wind could cause a little bit of wobble. There's also the heat haze because it's, you know, it's like 30 odd degrees Celsius down there right. in, uh, in South Texas. So, you know, we've got heat haze, we've got wind, we've got wobble. <laughs> we've got all the yep. things against us for a nice, close, balanced, tight up shot there. But it does look as if it's moving across. Poor Jack is experiencing it all. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We'll have to keep an eye on that and see how things are going here. You know, like and, in Looney Tunes when they're in the desert. And, like, yep. The, that's person, the, the animal looks at the other animal and like turns into a tangine, and the other one looks at the other one and turns into a leg. Yep. Yeah. That's that's where I'm at with Starship right now. I'm like, oh, look, it's a sausage. I'm gonna have a snack. All right. Good. <laughs> keep keep hydrated and, and energized out there, and uh, look out for the Roadrunner and the Coyote. So. Uh, yeah, so although it looks like we have cameras right next to this rocket, Alex, we're actually pretty far away. So we, we can't play with our own drones on SpaceX property. That would be a big no-no. Yeah, right now they have sort of the, the upper hand yeah. here because they are the only ones allowed to, to fly drones. And I'm continuing to uh, put up our store messages because we just released, if you're just tuning in, we've got over 20,000 people watching. We have a brand new patch you can see people ordering with a frenzy uh, in the upper right hand corner there this is a patch for uh, orbital flight test number two that is available right now no wait list we've got a bunch of other merchandise related to that as well so check it out and uh we're acknowledging uh store messages and there you can see that drone mm, not a spec anymore yeah it's like a, like an off-the-shelf dji model doesn't it <laughs> see this rotation kind of gives you a side view of those yeah, raptor awesome. vacuums that i was mm -hmm. talking about and precisely now you can see, so now it's like, aha, now I know what that new plate thingy on, on the Raptor is. So uh, basically the, there's, there's like a cooling line. It's those Raptors, it's not like the, the, the Merlin vacuum. The Merlin vacuum is relatively cool. It glows red hot. These are not gonna, uh, not, they're not gonna glow red hot because they are cooled with methane. And so one of the pipes that goes down the side of the nozzle, that is basically what it has that plate over. And I'm mostly sure that's probably because they want to protect it, maybe from the raptors. I'm not fully sure though, but def f from the from the center raptors, I'm I'm talking here. Um, but w we'll see, we'll see. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's basically one of the theories that I have in mind right now. See, I've changed my mind after. <laughs> After seeing more and thinking more about it, you know, these theories change because you got to give us time. <laughs> hey, we've got a $100 tip, by the way, from Richard, a.k.a. Methane Man. And that's fitting because this is a methane powered rocket and uh, money for the camera fund and keep the field guys going. Yeah, Jack uh, can use all the support he can get right now, getting uh, cooked out there in the sun, uh, keeping an eye on things for us over at Starbase. And we're getting very close to uh, like soon a mating of the booster and the starship but thank you methane man for yeah, your support that's, that's a serious amount of contribution there and i almost missed that with all of the store messages we've been getting <laughs> yes, but yeah fast and furious if it, today. <laughs> yeah uh, tips.nasaspacewide.com it's a more a bit more of a direct way to support us if you are so inclined and that's yeah again that's a that's a serious piece of contribution that we re we are we are very very grateful for it really you know helps to keep things moving here because it's not that i i I wouldn't say that sitting around waiting for things to happen is the most enjoyable job in the world, but when it happens, it's just so cool to see. 
It's awesome. And I'm doing my best here to get everyone acknowledged on screen here. We've got, they're just coming in fast and furious because those patches are going. <laughs> so we'll do our best to acknowledge everybody. I know uh, folks in the back channel are keeping an eye on things too. So we'll try our best to uh, make sure we get as many acknowledgements as we can uh, on the stream today. And speaking of methane, while we have uh, on the topic of uh, methane man, uh, these are methane powered rockets. It seems like methane is like the new fuel everybody's using, right, Alex? Yeah, the, the, uh, so, so, sorry, I, I blank in there. Um, can you repeat the question? Please? Yeah, just the, the, uh, the, the, the industry trend here is moving away from other fuels. Yes. It's like everyone's going to methane. Vulcan is methane and Astra, I think, is mm -hmm. methane. Is that right? Maybe I'm wrong about math. But it's one of the rockets that, that, that's methane. Relativity. Relativity. And then, of course, we have uh, Starship here running on methane as well. What's, what's the deal with methane? Well, it's, it's a very good in between uh, kerosene and hydrogen. It doesn't leak as much as hydrogen, and it is most, it, it is, it, it's definitely more energetic than, than the kerosene. It, it provides a lot of more specific, specific impulse to the engines, which is sort of like the mileage is the word. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, sort of like that. Miles per gallon. Yeah, more efficient. Miles per gallon, whatever. Yeah, we, we, we sort of do liters per 100 kilometers or something, but. <laughs> yeah, anyways, um, yeah, it, it, it is basically the efficiency of the engine. So the methane allows for a much better efficiency at similar, you know, similar temperatures and similar pressures. You're going to get more performance out of methane than from the kerosene. It is less performance, though, than the hydrogen, but it's much easier to use than hydrogen. Hydrogen likes to leak from everywhere. What do you think this, this venting we're hearing is? Could just be something else on the in the pad area. Yeah, it's very common to to hear a lot of venting either from the ground support system. Uh, sometimes the booster might vent here and there. This this venting though sounds like the the, the ground support systems basically. Looks like we I, are pretty much over the top here. Yeah. The apogee. And I'm hearing on the back channel here that it's coming from the vent to the right of the OLM in front of the damaged tank. Probably just a common venting going on down there. That. Yeah, people who have been to the, the, the site, like our, our photographers, and I'm sure Adrian would say this as well, this, this is a very much an alive site. Things are always happening down here. Venting, uh, plumbing operations, you know. Even ship stacking sometimes. This is a very much a, an active site that is constantly being worked on 24-7, both here at the production site, uh, sorry, here at the launch site, down the road at the production site, and also down the road at the Massey's test site. You know, those are the three main areas SpaceX operate in this in this region. And, you know, they're always active. They're always doing stuff. It's very much an alive site. Now it's more like 29... Oh, not 29. Oh, boy. 25-9. See, my joke just... Went out of the window. You tried. I and tried and I failed. <laughs> yep. Hey, uh, Stefan uh, Batiste here says, uh, any, everybody who thinks uh, NSF should abduct Chris G and send them back to work on our stream, say indeed. <laughs> I miss Chris G. <laughs> I, I've known Chris for a long time. Big guy. So it seems as if the, the, the movement has just been paused slightly. Potentially because of their, the, 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 they want to be more careful with the new ring, the new hot stage ring. But it's definitely, you know, it, this angle doesn't really help to show the scale because it looks, oh, there's just a tiny, tiny bit of room left there. But remember, this thing, the ship itself, is 50 meters tall. The booster is 70 meters tall. These scales are mind-boggling. So this wide-angle view, you might be like, oh, there's a it's few nothing. centimeters between them. No, that, like that is, a, that's a significant <laughs> gap. Meters, <laughs> feet, and me yards and meters. <laughs> and Alex, they've got to be, obviously this is a very precise joining here. Um, how do they line it up? I guess it's just a matter of lowering it down very slowly and adjusting. Is somebody eyeballing this? Is there some automation involved? Or do we not they have, know? They have a ton of, of sensors and cameras and things like that. Um, they do have some automation here, um, just basically because of how smooth some of these operations work. It kind of looks like uh, when it is automated, it's basically like on command. Sort of like when 
I'm, I'm gonna put again Dragon as a, as a comparison here, but it kind of works like that. Where Dragon is automated, sure, but it only does things when commanded to. So if you don't command the, the vehicle to do a thing, then it doesn't do it. And so it seems like it is pretty much like that, where you see it move very smoothly, right. um, and you're like, hmm, that doesn't look like hand done, right? It's not like someone with a joystick moving moving the ship. So it, it kind of looks very much automated. But then there are points like this where they stop, they look, carefully look at things, the alignment, and everything. One Just thing like we were talking about. Yeah, one thing we were talking about earlier is that th this basically latches on to a, a few latching points. So it's not just a matter of getting it aligned properly on the vertical. It's also making sure that those those latches can connect to Starship. Yeah, and one problem that they had, as I mentioned before with Ship 24, they had one problem where it was unbalanced and it was probably unbalanced by less than a degree of, you know, of leaning uh, and the problem is, with such a huge vehicle, we're talking about a huge displacement, even when it is less than a degree. It, you know, a, a, a less than a degree the, uh, slope or, or like lean, this is 9 meters wide, 120 meters tall. You're going to see a lot, of, a, a lot of displacement. And so you need to carefully position this on those three pins need to have the ship on the right position for the for the booster to take on the load and the booster takes that load and transmits that to the to the hold downs to the pedestals on the olm so if you have the vehicle not positioned properly those pedestals are going to have imbalance as well they're going to be imbalanced and so that's not a good thing when you have 5000 tons on top right. of them Right now it is empty, but once you load propellant on it, if it's it a imbalanced, lot mm -hmm. yeah, it gets a lot a lot heavier, and so you don't want those pedestals to get, you know, one part more imbalanced than the other and getting more weight than the other. You want to be distributed everything properly. So it is very careful operation here. And Ryan, the the booster is is basically tied down to the pad at the moment as well. So you have some something keeping it kind of latched down, but you still have to balanced here don't you yeah uh, uh but but come launch day that the 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 mass of the of the ship and the booster is really the only th is the key component in keeping it stuck down the uh the little latches that they have in the orbital launch mount they kind of unlatch as we approach t0 and then at that point it's just the mass of the vehicle keeping itself on 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 the ground but you know it's still it's still somewhat stabilized by by the orbital launch mount Getting very close to action here. We've got over 21,000 people watching right now. There is a lot of interest in here. I suspect we'll get a few more when this thing actually launches, don't you think? Hopefully we get a few more people when this thing actually launches. The amount of support we got throughout the entire flight campaign of, of uh, Ship 24 and Booster 7 was incredible. So I'm sure it'll be uh, equally, if not more, incredible with this launch coming up, hopefully, Fingers crossed, very soon. I know we speculated about this earlier when we had um, uh, fewer viewers in, um, and I just lost <laughs> just lost the chat, but, but uh, Karen was asking, uh, when do we think we can see a launch? And Alex, I guess we still have to get that FAA approval, but, but assuming that, mm. how, how long do you think they'll be ready? They'll be ready. I think once they get the approval to go ahead, it's going to be a matter of days, perhaps three days, just like the last time they got approval on a Friday and they attempted the first flight on Monday. Sadly, they scrapped that Monday, but they went ahead three days later on a Thursday, Thursday, April 20th, and then they were able to, to go and, and launch. Now, you were talking about we have, you know, more than 20,000 people. I totally understand them. Uh, you know, you, you probably hear myself and I'm like, oh, well, whatever. Internally, I'm super hyped because uh, it's like, this is the first tag since that first flight. This is the first time we see another full, fully stacked vehicle here at Starbase. It is exciting because it is also going to be the preparations for the second flight of a Starship, the world's most powerful rocket, and and also the, the tallest now because it's even you know it surpassed the previous stack. Uh, so 
yeah, by all means, I'm super hyped and super pumped for this. We don't expect this to be the last one, as we mentioned before earlier in the stream. We sort of expect that maybe they, they'll be stacked for pulling the pins on the flight termination system, but it's a quick thing there that they do, and then they restack again, and up it goes. So, yeah, very excited. This one is more consequential because this is the first time these two pieces have been mated together like this, especially with that ring on there. So that's uh, that's what makes this uh, kind of special at this point. And here's a question from our chat. And by the way, if you want to um, get something noticed by us, if you chat us at, at NASA Spaceflight, we will see it uh, a lot better than, um, than just a regular chat, just because there's so many <laughs> chats going on here. But uh, at NASA Spaceflight in the chat, no, no payment required, we'll uh, get you noticed there. Um, you think they'll static fire ship 25 while on top of the booster? I don't think they would do that. I mean, would they? Or maybe they, I guess they could try because it supposedly could handle it, right? It would be kind of not needed, if I should say it that way. Static firing whilst on top of the, on top of the booster. Kind of risky, hot staging, right? <laughs> hot staging does mean your second stage starts its engines before it disconnects from your first stage. But... There's a difference between igniting your engines for a second or two whilst you're still connected and then releasing compared to igniting your engines whilst still attached to the booster and then not detaching from the booster. There's a difference there and the impact on the top of the booster will be different with that process as well. So there isn't really a need to static fire Ship 25 whilst it's on top of Booster 9 through the hot staging ring. If they needed another static fire out of Ship 25, they would have done that whilst on the ground. If they need data and testing from the, hot sta from the hot stage ring, that's the entire point of the second integrated flight, to test this vehicle as much as possible. So any testing and data that they would get from a static fire of the ship attached to the hot staging ring, you can get that on the ground and you can get that in flight. There's no reason, in my opinion, to risk it whilst attached on the pad. That's also the argument that I usually try to make as well, that while you could do that, it will not be a reliable test because the environment at which the engines fire when it is time for stage separation, it's going to be sort of like 60, 70, 80 kilometers high up. And while there's still a bit of atmosphere, it is near vacuum. Like the amount of atmosphere is really very, very little. And we know what happens when rockets go up and, you know, the, ex the exhaust expands. And so the way that it's going to hit the, the plate, the sort of shield on top of the, of the hot staging ring, it's not going to be the same as it will be on the ground. When it is on the ground, basically the, the pressure, the atmospheric pressure makes the exhaust beam basically a jet. Whereas in the vacuum of a space, it expands. And so the area that it covers is much larger. And so... It, it is actually less heating that it that it produces per unit of area and so it will not be i think any realistic test if you were to do it on the ground the real test is going to be on launch day i see multiple drones uh circling the uh pad here looks like they're keeping a close eye on things because we are not quite yet mated to the ring at the top of the booster so I would suspect right now, Ryan, they're taking their time to make sure that everything is aligned properly before they bring it back down. Yeah, the the, the gap there is holding steady. And of course, we, there's, there's nobody up there to keep an eye on the gap. So the drones are really the best way SpaceX can keep an eye on the size of that gap, make sure everything's aligned, whilst they bring the ship down very, very, very slowly. So yeah, you can see this is a close-up. This is our close-up ground-based camera but because of angles and the way that physics and geometry works, we can't see directly through without being at the same height as that gap. So that's why SpaceX is uses the drip, uses the drip, put my teeth back in again, uses <laughs> the drones in this application. Everyone's been working hard here so I could understand the, uh, the issues finding the words. I, I get like that too. And Alex, sorry, this, sorry if there's a lot of wind noise, but, uh, yeah, it doesn't, I don't know if it's an optical illusion or what, but it doesn't look quite lined up to me. Um, like it could, I could be completely just seeing things or heat stroke or whatever, but it looks a little bit off. So maybe they're just taking their time to make sure it's exactly right. That is Jack out in the field, who's got a, a uh, view of this, uh, this stacking operation right now, and this might be why it's being delayed a bit here. And as, as you can really all see, see, 
Yeah, the atmosphere is so thick from <laughs> from mm -hmm. the heat today. Yeah. It's hard to hard to make out if there's something being moved or if it's just the uh, the air that we're observing there. So we'll have to keep an eye on things for a little bit longer. But I'm guessing they're going to be uh, very careful here before they finally attach it. And Alex, this is a really stupid question, but does this thing like snap into those latches? Like, how does it secure itself? Because I don't think there's anybody in there <laughs> to get this there's... all latched up. Uh, well, there are two, there are three pins, uh, and it's basically settled down. So it's it's a little more complicated to just settle down. So the pins, the geometry of the pins themselves, kind of help to guide down the the vehicle onto the booster. And so it it's sort of like a triangle. And so as you lower down, that kind of makes the, the the pin go into the sort of the, the hole in there and and pushes left right and so, and so the geometry itself already is prone to help on that alignment but obviously before before you even do that you need to position carefully the the ship and you know what? i take i take back everything i said it looks fine and I, I think it's starting to slowly go down but again mm. could be heat stroke <laughs> combination of heat stroke in the atmosphere but you've had a lot of support here today jack so uh so you will be well hydrated um at least in the future thanks thanks everybody thank you for, for sticking by us out there we really appreciate it hey i got a, a another question for this is a trivia question that came in via the chat from keith glazier um is the previous starship stack now considered the second tallest rocket in history because this does add a little bit of height to it doesn't it ryan it's new rig. yeah it, 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 I mean, there's no other way of saying it. It does. Um, it's not the exact same height, I don't believe, of all of the other rings. Uh, I think it's close, but you know, it's definitely a special design considering all of the other rings don't have holes cut in them, and that definitely. It's, you know, it's a, it's a full size six foot ring. It's a full size ring, is it? Oh, okay. But um, mm. as I was saying, it, it, it needs some extra integrity because they've had to cut holes in it and the normal rings don't have that and when you cut holes ring it it kind of compromises the integrity a little bit which is why behind those slots you can see so much more um so much more steel it's it, it's much much more enforced than, than the other rings are and, and uh, robert hall has a question about whether or not we think this uh this ring is going to be reusable between launches i would imagine it would be but it's going to get pretty, pretty abused out there isn't it alex well um Elon already kind of talked about this, where he was asked whether they will try to to sort of look at Booster 9s after it's splashdown, and it, if it actually, you know, gets to the point of a splashdown, if they're going to look at the hot staging ring. And his comment sort of sounded like they're not going to worry that much, and that right now they just want it to work, in the sense that, look, if at the end of the hot staging the booster is still in one piece, it already works, right? And we'll worry about reusing it at a later point, right? They might either way, they're not getting this booster back, so it's, it's exactly it's just a matter of proving the concept, and then they can they can move forward. And and right, that kind of speaks to, to SpaceX, the way SpaceX designs. It's very iterative. If you if you compare this to uh, the uh, space launch system, which had to be had to work right the first time, um, SpaceX yeah. has has blown up several <laughs> rockets i would say they've probably yeah. blown up more rockets than any other rocket maker in history but that's how they how they design right that's how spacex operates sls is a let's work it out all on paper first and then launch it design starship is very much a let's design this thing let's see if it works by flying it and then we'll iterate off of that design and that's just really how they've always operated. Let's build this design, let's launch it. If it doesn't work, let's see how we fix it. Let's try this fix, launch it. If it doesn't work, let's bring it back, put a new design on it, see if it works. And they'll keep doing that, keep iterating until they have a successful design. And they'll probably keep doing that process very much far into Starship's future with all of the additional things, you know. Does this method improve efficiency of the rocket? Yes, it does. Let's put that on all of the future vehicles. Does this method make it easier to stick tiles on the site? Yes, let's put that on all the vehicles in future. We've seen that with Falcon 9. They, 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 the, the efficiency of the Falcon 9 has increased throughout its entire lifespan, even with Block 5, which is why we can now see, for example, on crew missions, they can return the booster because SpaceX has all of that extra iteration, all of that extra data, all of that extra testing. They can bring those boosters back with a more high energy mission. 
it looks like we're getting a lot closer here. We're seeing a, less of a gap, probably just feet now versus yards as we're closing in. And that brings us to a question that we got from uh, Jory here about the economics and launch architecture. I mean, really, this is designed to almost function like an airliner that you can bring it back and launch it again. You don't have to build a new rocket for each mission. And presumably, Alex, that would deliver us a much more cost-effective way to get into space. Hopefully, yeah. Um, while this rocket is much larger, since it is supposed to be fully reusable, then you can spread all of those codes among many, many flights. Um, but yeah, we can see that the gap is... Closing it, up. It's getting very, very small. Yeah. Yeah, Go on, real it's just going to be it. mere centimeters now. I'd say maybe five to ten centimeters yeah. of gap. The atmosphere is so deceiving because you can't tell if it's <laughs> if it's moving slightly from side to side or if it's just the air. I think it's the air. Also, the angle may be slightly deceiving because on the left side it looks closer than it is on the right. But I wonder right. if that's just because we're kind of seeing it from a little bit of a little bit of an offset angle here. You see, on yeah. this angle, everything seems kind of even, but we are further away here. I think Das needs to build a tower out there so that we can get straight on like that. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we need our own launch tower for cameras. Yeah, and knowing Das, I think he would probably be thinking about a way to do that right now. <laughs> I see him in our back chat. He goes, what do I need to build? I need a tower about as big as that <laughs> so we can see it. I want one on. of those. Can we have one, one of those? those? Ooh, yeah, so we can, can get it from two different angles. Can we get the budget for a 140 meter tall tower? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's what all the pa new patches will be going towards. <laughs> Our yeah, own Starship right. Launch Tower for the cameras. <laughs> hey, everyone wins because people will get the views and they will also get the patches. So, look, everyone wins here. Right. That's right. Those patches will go towards a uh, tower fund. And the pun, pun fund. And here's another question from Mix Moto. Um, so yeah, this is a continuing question about the launch abort system. We haven't talked about that in a little while. We've got about double the viewers that we had since the first time. Um, what about the launch escape system or the, the launch abort system? We have to, well, they have to reinstall that before we get to launch. So it's likely that this this uh, mating and it will be demated and repeated. Is that a correct assumption? Well, the the explosive, as, as they call it, there. Um, it is probably already installed, but again, they have this physical safety system. It's like a set of pins that actually physically inhibits the system. And you need to remove that in order to have any sort of way to actually arm the system. And the system is armed during the countdown, sort of usually around the last five minutes of the countdown. Um, and so that is an important thing here that I don't think they will remove it the explosive actually it might actually be there already by now it's just again with the with that physical safety system in place so we will <clears throat> probably observe a little bit more work going on here before we are ready for launch but this is a big one because this is the first time we have mated a booster with the new hot staging ring with starship so they are being super cautious here. I still see some gap there. So we're not totally joined here. But it looks like we're getting pretty close. Let that it continue looks as if to... the gap may have evened out even slightly from the left yeah. and the right side. It's really yeah. hard to see, especially with the, uh, with the atmosphere in the way. This pesky atmosphere. <laughs> the one that uh, poor Jack is out in the middle of right now. Hey, we got yeah. some uh, red team membership gifts. I'm gonna try to catch up with as many of these supporter messages as I can here. We have so many <laughs> due to the uh, the very popular uh, patches that we are now selling at shop.nasaspaceflight.com. Um, but we do have some gifted membership thank yous here from Father Peter Shaw, five uh, red team memberships. Thank you very much for that. And Apocalypse Cow with 10 red team membership gifts. Again, that's the best part about hanging out and chat. Eventually uh, you may get gifted a membership. Appreciate everyone's support because all of the cameras you're watching here are NSF cameras. And they're operated by NSF staff members who work extremely hard and keep an eye on things 24 7. But it's looking a lot like a almost completed booster and Starship uh, package here. 
certainly more than we saw this morning when Starship was on the ground next to it. It's weird because on the on the windward side, touching. On the leeward side, it looks more like the gap is like a foot. Um, again, could be heat stroke, but <laughs> yeah, it's on the one on the one side it looks like it's almost down, if not down. On the other side, it looks like it still has a ways to go. And here's a closer up shot here. It looks like it does have a little bit more to go here. I love that you can see the, the engines through yeah. the hot staging ring. Yeah. This is going to make the some things, great photos. One of the things that I love of this view as well is you can see that pin sort of in the center left is one of the pins, the three pins on the booster hot staging ring. It doesn't have, at least I don't see the hook in the middle deployed, sort of retracted, which is what we will expect. It only deploys once the ship is right in the place that it needs to be and then the hooks deploy and engage and that's when it is all connected. Smooth oh, there. Cool. Again, they're being very careful about this as our chatter here mentions because they want to take pictures, they want to make sure they've got everything lined up. This is the first time these two pieces of hardware have been mated together and they're doing it on the pad um, with the uh, now, certainly not as expensive as an Artemis uh, mission rocket might be, but still, you know, this is a lot of hardware and you don't want to move too quickly, especially when you're first uh, mating things together here. And uh, that brings us to oh, oh. this uh, chat question related to that uh, statement I just made uh, from Lorraine's DK. Um, will stacking be faster in the future? And you both have been watching stacks for quite a while. Is it getting faster or is it about the same? It's pretty much the same. Um, it, it, it does feel like whenever you introduce something new, like today, it gets slower. Um, today, it does feel a little bit slower than on previous times. But again, we have a new thing on the booster, right? And so it makes sense that they're taking just a little extra time to get things in the right position. So um, I'm not going to fault anyone. Oh, you're taking so long. Oh my gosh, right? <laughs> It's completely understandable. And here's a more of a speculative question here from uh, Christian Pina. I was wondering how much will the cost of the program from Starship uh, for one for one Starship test flight would be? Well, I guess it would be the cost of what the Starship rocket costs plus the fuel and all the <laughs> the staffing to go into it, right? Because we're not getting any of these pieces back after this first flight. It's just a matter of trying to get it to complete in orbit and then a deorbit, and hopefully have it deorbit where they hope to have it deorbit to. And that would pretty much be it. But in the future, we're gonna see a lot more of this. And Ryan, you know, part of the, the Artemis program to land people on the moon is going to depend on this system working, right? The lander for Artemis three and four, I think, maybe even five, definitely for three, is gonna be a starship, it's a modified starship. No flaps, no tiles, it's gonna be painted white according to the renders apparently. And it's gonna have some windows, gonna have a little doors, gonna have a little lift for the astronauts to get from the top of the starship down to the lunar surface. But yeah, NASA is depending on starship in order to land their people on the moon in 2026, 7, 8, 9, whenever you think it's gonna happen. <laughs> 2020 so yeah. Hope. As the we're... gap seems to have gotten even smaller now. Yeah, we're down to inches here. If not, if not done, I don't know. What do you think? No, Probably it's not done. Here. Yeah. yeah. All right, Ryan. The angles are deceiving, aren't they? Yeah, but the gap's definitely gotten smaller than last time. Mm. It is something that you know. It, it is still not down. But just this view, looking at that extra ring, it kind of feels weird already. Even though we, we've seen stat, you know, stacked ships on boosters previously, but this view from the distance, seeing the whole rocket, even though it's not fully stacked yet, it's still a few inches to go. It already gives you the sensation that, yeah, this is gonna be a, a much different flight this time around. I cannot wait to see it. And they've certainly <laughs> learned a lot from the last one. Yeah. One thing we don't know, and this is a question that came in from Bunko here, is uh, do you think the hot staging ring will stand a chance against the S-25 Raptors? I guess we're going to find out. Yeah. 
So that, that would be is... something to be seen. <laughs> <laughs> we we had the other day on an SF Live, uh, Jack was like, okay, you know, rapid fire answer. And, and it's like, I think it might not survive, <laughs> but I <laughs> want it to survive. I, I, I really want it. Like my wish obviously is that the ship goes all the way to Hawaii. It goes through the through re-entry and everything. But sometimes one also has to be a little bit realistic. And my hope is that at least it makes it off from the orbital launch mount. But yeah, that gap has gone down yeah. a lot here. It's a lot now. I guess One the big of the things. Is... Oh, oh go, sorry, ahead. go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was, was going to ask you, like, you know, at some point they have to, you know, right now it's kind of resting on those on those chopsticks. I guess the moment of truth is when they release that that uh, those Precisely. chopsticks, and it has to stand on its own. Yeah, I, I I was actually thinking about that right now. That maybe we can we can hold some of these views for a sec because right now it is, let's say, the moment of truth, when yeah, right now. Sure, it is on the pins, and maybe the hooks are already even engaged. We don't know because it is all inside of the of, of the of the structure and everything. We don't have cameras there, sadly. Uh, hi, SpaceX. <laughs> if you want us to, <laughs> be happy here. to put them up there. I see a exactly. great spot we can mount our cameras on there. Doss certainly knows where to put them. <laughs> yep. So we don't we don't really know now what's going on. But one way to figure out whether it is settled or not is sort of like keeping a close camera and keeping it not moving at all and then see if the, hot, the, the whole stack just wiggles a bit. It looks kinda see real that. close. It looks yeah. Really, really close. They got a drone right above the QD staring at the last little bit. Yeah, the last time that they stacked, um, you couldn't even see how they had a stack because it was so clean and so beautiful that you 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 couldn't see any sort of indication right. that they have actually yeah, exactly together, right? <laughs> exactly, right? Yeah. Whereas one of the times they actually stacked it bad again, that that sort of alignment, and you could see the whole stack just you know as they settle the ship, as those chopsticks stop carrying the weight. You could see the whole stack leaning on the close-up cameras. You, you couldn't see that on the far views like this, for example. But it was something that on the close-up cameras, it was like, oh my gosh, it moved a lot. Right? And and, and, and I, I remember being scared almost. <laughs> Hopefully that's not going to happen today, though. Right. Let's hope not. Let's hope not. And uh, we have a $20 uh, tip from Joe E. says, good job. Thanks for the smart, detailed coverage. And another 5 bucks for... Uh, Jack out in the field, uh, who has earned his Gatorade. <laughs> so that's the Gatorade fun going out there. So thank you very much for that. And I guess we're not going to get any real confirmation from SpaceX that this is finally made it, other than we just have to watch and see if they move those chopsticks away. Yeah, the 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 stack here is really like it looks as if it's now fully stacked. But there's also a point to be made that even if they're gonna, even if the ship and the booster are touching, the chopsticks are still there. They're still gonna be carrying a lot of the weight of that ship, so they have to slowly allow the booster to pick up the weight of the ship once the chopsticks have done their job. I'm sure we'll get some sort of tweet from SpaceX probably over the next few hours saying we've fully stacked Starship 25 Booster 9 ahead of the next flight test, blah, 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 and some PR thing in there as well. Um, but in, t in terms of from, from what we can see, the ship and the booster definitely seem to be touching. If not, they are incredibly close to touching at this point. Yeah, I see a lot of people in chat anxiously asking about the quick disconnect. So the arm has moved in, but there's a problem. And it is that I don't think the ship is ready to accept the quick disconnect, the umbilical itself. I, I would like to be wrong though, but usually for past stacks, we've seen them going up. So one of the, it might not be actually the, the, the chopsticks going out, but maybe we could have in the field, <laughs> Uh, reports of people just coming in again back to the, to the overall launch mount and once we see that it's because it is completed it might not be even the chopsticks you know opening or anything like it once people come back it, it is already safe to to be there and so the operations have finished 
I'll tell you what, it looks like a, a full stack to me, but you know, it's the, uh, the details now are, are within centimeters perhaps. Uh, so we will just keep, uh, keep our, our watch here and see what uh, develops here as we uh, take a few more questions that are coming in. Um, here's one I think maybe for Alex from Odd Perspective and from the chat. And we are just overwhelmed with support and chats here, so we're doing our best to keep up. Um, does the hot stage ring remove the need for venting LCH4 out the bottom of the booster? Because you no longer sealed inside, right? I... Bottom of the booster or the ship? I'm, I'm assuming maybe they mean the ship, right? Yeah, m maybe they can they can clarify. I'm looking at the chat, by the way, flood perspective. If you, if you can clarify that, but definitely, my if if it's the ship, it. I don't think they they sort of vent any methane out of the bottom of the of the ship, nor the booster, for that matter. So, yeah. How, for example, this this other one. How has the addition of the venting ring changed in the shield? Um, we've seen those chill pipes as well being integrated with with the hot staging ring. It's basically an extension of the already uh, of the of the presence there, and so the. The, the engine chill is still there, the, the venting there is present, and so, yeah, I, I now see the, the comment from, from Flood perspective. Uh, there was a pipe going from the bottom of the ship to the bottom of the booster. I do not think it goes to the bottom of the booster, it just goes a little bit to the side of the booster, and that is the engine chill pipe. Uh, they have added another pipe, because this is like pipe uh, a pipe dream, <laughs> as the <laughs> other person uh, commented before, right? That right. it was... Uh, Lots of pipes going on here. Uh, they have another one, we believe, that is for maybe purges um, and venting, um, sort of like its own fire extinguisher, onboard fire extinguisher to avoid any sort of fires on the engine section. But yeah. And then we have uh, some other chats here commenting about the uh, what will be considered a successful mission. And Electric Dawn says, uh, even when Starship only makes it to orbit and not back in one piece, it'll be a massive success and milestone already. No other rocket is as cheap and as fast to manufacture. And that's actually very true because if you think about it, um, we, we witnessed just not that long ago a launch pad and an entire rocket getting destroyed. And now we've got essentially a rebuilt launch pad, a brand new rocket and booster, and we're ready to go again, likely whenever they get the nod from the FAA, Ryan. I mean, how many Starships are they cranking out down there? They're, they're up to 31 or 32 or something along those lines now. They're, they've, they've got a few in progress or waiting around. And they've also got boosters in progress or waiting around. It's, you know, I wouldn't say, you know, they're exactly ready to launch them all tomorrow. So it's not like they're waiting on the FAA. But there's a there's a good stock of starships if, if production has to slow down for any reason between now and, and when that could become an issue. Yeah, and I, I just find it amazing too. When you, again, when you go back and look at just how much they had to rebuild here, um, and now here we are, you know, not that, not that far off from that first uh, orbital launch attempt. And even then, Alex, I, I would say that from SpaceX's perspective, um, just getting it off the ground as they did and have a pretty much controlled flight was a, was probably a success. They were hoping for more on that first launch, but the way SpaceX operates here is they they kind of build a minimally viable product take it as far as they can and then build the next one and this is the next the next mm. step there what do you think i think this one's going to do a lot better <laughs> uh there's there's a thing that i usually try to say that i don't want to think that it is going to do better because i already had that idea when the when you know when they were doing these hops tests uh and they flew sn8 and it flew so well uh it almost got almost all the way to the to the ground in one piece Sadly, you know, one of the engines got a bit of a, a hiccup there with, you know, the methane header tank and everything failed. Um, but then when SN9 flew, we all thought that it was going to nail the landing and it didn't. So I don't want to think it's going to do better. I'm going to think it's at least going to gonna match uh, what, you know, the first flight did and hopefully without breaking the pad. So basically going out, clearing the pad, this time without a crater underneath and just going out and catch as much, as, as much data as you can and if it goes through staging yeah that's gonna be way way better than the, right. than the first flight and i will hopefully you know I, I do hope we see that but you know 
Yeah. And uh, we have a chat from Nunya who says, do you guys think the deluge system will mitigate any damage during the full launch? And it looks like the, the hot fire, um, the static fire did pretty well um, with, with the water system there, but it was only at, at half thrust. So uh, Ryan, are we thinking this, this system might help here or, or no? It's going to be much better than just concrete. It's going to, it's, <laughs> it's the, it is kind of the tip. Apart from staging, this really is the ticket for a successful a successful flight. This is what SpaceX needs in order to not destroy their launch pad. The joke was going around from the first integrated flight test. SpaceX are developing a reusable launch system, but they're not developing reusable launch pads. You know, if you want to be launching this thing multiple times a day, you need a launch pad that can su support multiple launches a day. I said it in the video that's coming out very shortly. You imagine if an airport had to resurface the runway every flight or every X number of flights. It, commercial aviation just wouldn't be viable. You need your ground infrastructure to be able to support multiple and multiple flights. If not, this just isn't sustainable. So that deluge system really needs to work with the full thrust of those 33 Raptors on the bottom of the booster in order to make this pad rapidly reusable because that's what they want to do with the booster. That's what they want to do with the ship. So everything needs to be able to be reused in, in a short amount of time. One of the things we were discussing on, on one of our other streams is that the, the pads that are used for the you know, the rockets that we're currently using on an operational basis, like the Falcon 9 and, and the uh, Atlas V and others, you know, those, those pads get beat up. There's concrete damage even on those pads that are designed to take a rocket that size that they're frequently having to go and repair uh, following launches. So this is... You know, it's, it's, it's one thing to have a reusable rocket, but you need a reusable pad, as you mentioned. And it just goes to show you, it, when people say space is hard, it is hard because there's just a lot of, of things to manage and a lot of different disciplines of engineering that go into it. It's not just rocket science. And to some degree, the uh, civil engineering and, and the mechanical engineering that goes into the ground systems is, is just as, if not more complicated, uh, to keep everything working. So when we talk about a system, it is a system from top to bottom. And Alex, they're building a very similar structure at the Kennedy Space Center right now, too. Yeah, um, the, the the one though at 39A, it is not fully built. I don't think they have actually gone ahead and built like the deluge system for that place. They did do sort of like a manifold for the distribution of water up to the to the launch, basically to the to the base. Of the overall launch mount but it is very green in in some sense right it, it is not fully developed right now so we'll, we'll have to see though what happens with... yeah, they probably want to test it out here to see if it works before they they do something over there which will cost you know, hmm. a lot of money <laughs> to construct and, yeah. and not have it work and what what's going to happen there i, I was uh, following some of the, the the plans for the upcoming mission they have to get hls into orbit which is the human landing system basically a starship designed to land on the moon and then when it's in orbit, they got to fuel it so it can get to the moon. So there's going to be multiple Starship launches, presumably Starship landings, <laughs> where they're going to be building a new rocket for each one just to get fuel up to it. Um, so we're going to be seeing this uh, this uh, stacking and launching and landing and restacking uh, quite frequently in the run-up to Artemis 3. So we're, we're going to have a lot to do here at NSF in the future, just following these missions. So what you're seeing today um, with this stacking uh, is something that is going to be the norm and is going to be happening quite frequently as uh, as they make progress here. And I know we um, answered this uh, before about the stacking, but I would imagine um, to this uh, chat we got, uh, will stacking be faster in the future? It's, it's probably going to get faster as they get a handle as to the things that they need to think about and not think about as they're uh, stacking these rockets together. And I guess in the future, Ryan, when, when these come down, um, they will be uh, basically restacked, <laughs> right? So there, there's a whole process of, of catching the rocket with those chopsticks, putting it down, uh, reassembling it, and then putting it back up again, right? Yeah, uh, it's the process which is the, uh, the, the quickest, and let's say the process with the least mass on the vehicle that SpaceX has come up with. The reason for those chopsticks is to eliminate the need for landing legs. So that is that it, that process needs to work for this kind of this theory this methodology of launching and landing uh, it, it, it is a critical component because without them the ship can't land the booster can't land when landing on things like the moon the ships we imagine they'll have some kind of landing leg system but for those tanker flights that are just shuttling between the earth and low earth orbit 
the chopsticks are going to become, are going to, are going to become quite important. Sure are, because it's not only a lifter, it's also a catcher. <laughs> and speaking of uh, the chopsticks, you know, they're made out of, out of metal. And you know what else is made out of metal? Our me metal prints that we have at shop.nasaspaceflight.com. <laughs> Look at that. Wow. You can get a beautiful shot of the Hawaii-bound rockets, right? They're going to Hawaii with this, with this beautiful spaceship. Look at the detail on that. And these and are not just like not... paper, right? Like you're getting metallic prints here. Yeah, and this is not any ship or anything like that. This is the ship that you see on your screen on the right. Just a few minutes ago, this was taken by Jack out there in the field. It wow. is an amazing shot. You can see all of the engine shields there. You can see that, you know, all of those protections to, to be able to, you know, keep away the fury of those raptors. So if you want to have that hang yeah. on your wall, consider to get that. Because, I mean, I'm, I'm buying that. Just saying. If, if you remember, like, I don't know, two hours ago when I was mentioning how clean the section in that engine bay looks compared to previous ships, you can see in that image, that's basically what I was looking at when I said that. It it really just, it looks so good. I mean, it looks like a real spacecraft, y'all. doesn't look like something that was built in a tent. I mean, anyways, that's a metal print. Buy it if you like it. Thank you, everybody. That looks awesome, Jack. And this, this was just taken just now, and it's already for sale. So see how efficient we are? This is uh, the new era of space flight is efficiency. And, quick and if, you're putting that, if you're putting that or the patch in your cart right now, maybe wait like five minutes before you check out because there's another one coming down the pipe. Oh, wow. Ooh. So the, uh, the, store, the store is busy today. So they are definitely getting the stuff going. And again, you got that beautiful new patch that is available right now for... Uh, the second flight test and it's uh, fully embroidered as you can see it's just a very nice high quality patch to add to your collection and it was uh, designed by Pauline and it is a limited edition we've got enough in stock for today and, and probably for the next week or two but uh, definitely jump on it quickly if you uh, don't want to miss out on that and then we've got a lot of merchandise uh, with the patch on it including shirts and mugs and water bottles and all sorts of cool stuff over at shop.nasaspaceflight.com. And the best part about supporting us this way is that you get something and you also support the channel at the same time. So it's great. And one tip for you all, because I'm, I'm going to see, I say you all because I'm from New England. I can't quite do the y'all. <laughs> y'all. I'm, I'm waiting for Das to pop in on that one. Um, but uh, you all um, can take that website and just leave it on the screens of your loved ones because we're getting close to the holiday season and it's a great way to say hey you know you're looking for something for like me the guy that has everything i don't have a lot of stuff from that awesome space flight store so check it out shop.nasaspaceflight.com okay, i got a question here from juan lambers i'll put it up on screen here um is it just him or does s25 look somewhat dusty on the heat tiles compared to s24 I guess it's been out there collecting dust literally <laughs> right it's been out there for a very long time i mean we initially thought after the first flight that maybe spacex will skip s25 altogether move on to ship 28 but nope they've decided to fly ship 25 it was relegated to the masses test site for a little while if i recall correctly as well so it's been out it's been out in the south texan weather for many 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 weeks by itself essentially so it's definitely picked up some dust here and there, uh, but it also makes it easy to, to point out where they've added new tiles, where the ship uh, crane attachment points used to be. The newer tiles are pretty much like a jet black color, uh, which just makes them really easy to point out against all of the, uh, uh, I, I don't, I don't want to say older tiles, but more aged tiles. Right, seasoned tiles. Seasoned not, tiles, that's a not that's yet better flight terminology origin, for Which it. is the other word they like to use for things that have been, <laughs> that have been used before. And uh, Luca here with some super chats for field drinks. So we got to keep uh, keep Jack hydrated out there as he's watching things uh, finish up here. And it's hard to say we don't yet know if we are officially stacked, but it looks pretty stacked to me right now, Alex. Yeah, it is. It is hard to say because we obviously don't have full access, like 360 degrees to this vehicle. And so without close-up cameras and things like that, like they have, it's really difficult to to say. Um, again, one of one of the sort of indications that we will have is people are going to come back 
till your till your orbital launch mount it will not necessarily mean like it it might not be right after the chopsticks open so it might be people come in and then a few hours later the chopsticks open or something like that or they might not even open sometimes they leave it up there um unless they do some kind of test and then they open and it's some kind of impressive view when they open it's like you know like an angel looking down on the on the rocket but yeah that that's some of the indications i will see that it is fully you know the the whole operation is completed you see that tilt yeah beautiful shot gives you a sense of the of the size of this also as we look up the uh the rocket here now fully vertical Stacked. And there's the gap. Yep. On this side, it looks pretty... The seam looks quite nice, but again, we can't see the other side, so there's a good chance SpaceX is still working to bring the other side down and balancing the whole vehicle out. So uh, we're not going to call this operation is 100% fully complete until, you know, we're either told or it's, or it's pretty obvious. That you, one of the things that you do can see there is that the stabilizers on the chopstick arms have gone out. Uh, which is interesting. There's no more rocket. <laughs> <laughs> I saw I saw the camera going out, and I was like, "Yep, no more rocket." <laughs> Here's a question from uh, Adam here in the chat because we mentioned a, f a few minutes ago that we're going to have all these fueling missions going on. Why does Starship need to refuel up there, but Apollo did not? Is it just because we're carrying more cargo or humans? If you if if, if as I was saying before with the with the space shuttle external tank, you know, this ship is bigger than a shuttle external tank, which means this is going to be an order of magnitude larger than the Apollo command module. And if you remember the, the Apollo missions, the Saturn V with this massive rocket that lifted off the pad, but the only thing that made it to the moon was the service module, the command module, and the lunar module. And even then, the only thing that came back was the command module. Just that little capsule at the top. That's the only thing that came back. SpaceX wants to make this a fully recoverable system. The booster needs to return to land. The ship needs to return to land. This is a massive rocket. At this point, this is the tallest rocket that has ever been made with the new hot stage ring. It's even taller than the last stack. These refueling missions are required in order to get the fuel back into the vehicle, which they've already spent getting it into orbit. And it kind of, if you think about it, theoretically gives Starship an infinite range if you can just keep refueling it, essentially bringing your petrol station to your vehicle in order to keep right. it going. I mean, it doesn't have infinite range because you need to have, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of tankers flying alongside it at all, at all times. But you can see what I mean. The, the refueling is necessary in order to get to the destinations it wants to get to. So, you know, Apollo missions didn't need refueling because all they got to the moon and back was this tiny little capsule, smaller than the room I'm in right now, that housed three people for a, a, a week-long mission. You know, this is going to be going on month-long voyages out to Mars with potentially up to 100 people on board. The mass is just such a, a, an order of magnitude larger than what Apollo was capable of doing. And this speaks to the versatility of, of Starship as a design, because it's kind of an open slate, whereas in the past we had vehicles designed to go to one destination for one single mission. Um, due to the size of this, it can do a lot of different types of missions. It can land on the moon, it can go to Mars, you just configure the vehicle a little bit differently. And as we were talking yeah. earlier, uh, Alex, there's a lot of different ideas of what we can do with all this volume that we can get into orbit. Mm -hmm. It is the, the, the main issue sometimes is that people don't comprehend some of the scales that we're talking here and the the problem with with a starship precisely as Ryan mentioned is you want to recover everything and to recover everything you need to add hardware you need to basically reserve some of the propellant especially in the booster to do that propulsive landing uh, for the ship as well but it you know you, you don't need as much fuel because uh, it's smaller and you use a lot of the atmosphere with those flaps and everything. Uh, and all of those systems take mass. Ooh, look at that. Have you seen that? Yeah. That's got a bit of a it's, wobble there. Yeah. Yeah, that's the, the, the wobble that I talked about. 
So we can definitely say I wouldn't like to be stood under it. Yeah, yeah that, that no, sound no. was accompanied by a groan. I heard like a groan <laughs> and a buffalo sound. Not a buffalo, but like, you know, metal. I heard a loud metal and low sort of sound. So if you be down now. That was Jack from the field who uh, who heard what we saw. Um, clearly, those two pieces have have now been joined. Is uh, is this a an expected sound and visual that we just saw, Alex? <laughs> well, uh, boy, <laughs> yeah. So the last time that we saw a ship doing this, they had to destack and restack again. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah. Let's let's. Let's keep an eye on it and see what happens. <laughs> there was a definite wobble there. That wasn't the atmosphere. <laughs> boy, yeah, yeah. That was not the camera moving. That was the rocket. Boy. <laughs> and it's hard in this instance because you know this is not something SpaceX uh, broadcasts these kinds of operations. So, so we are using NSF's cameras located uh, next to Starbase, where we can see um, the massive rocket and pad from the road. Um, we're in a public Place, which is why we can bring this to you. Um, so we don't know what's going on. Um, we have a lot of experts on the call. Alex and, um, and Ryan here know what the other stuff when it comes to uh, this system and, and what's involved with it. But what we don't know is whether or not that was a normal outcome <laughs> or not. So we're going to have to just keep an eye on things. And I suppose uh, if we have a problem here, um, this would probably result in them de stacking the rocket. Probably not all the way. We've seen it before where they've put it on the booster and then took it up a little bit just to re, re realign it, I guess, and then put it back down and then, you know, job's good and they're happy with the result. But, yeah, it, it, it it's not a bad thing to see them readjusting it because we don't want SpaceX to leave the ship on top of a crooked booster, for example. You right. want to be careful with this. So we will keep an eye on things here and see... What is happening next here? And there's nobody there, right? That because of, because of the risk involved in this maneuver. So a lot of this, they're they're kind of looking at cameras like we are. So we will continue to keep an eye on things here, and we'll take a few more chats as we as we wait. Um, here's an unrelated question from Pascal. Yeah, this is a, a welded piece of equipment. Um, has welding ever been done in vacuum and in orbit? I would imagine they've probably done some kind of welding in vacuum here on Earth, but I don't think anyone's welded anything in vacuum in space, right? I don't, I don't... think they have... Oh, go ahead, Ryan. I, I was going to say exactly what you just said. I, I don't think so. I'm trying to think of any work outside of the ISS, but I believe that mo that would have just been prefabricated on the ground before it got shipped up on a on a shuttle or a Soyuz or a, or a Progress or a Dragon. Apparently, the Russians did. That's a saying in the back channel in the in the 60s. Cold uh, welding. Gagori uh, uh, Shonin and Valery Kubasov uh, <laughs> attempted to weld in space. Hmm. Well, that's uh, that's normal welding. What we're talking about, not cold welding, which is a different phenomenon, which actually uh -huh. happened on. I think it was Gemini. I'm not sure which of the of the missions, but I think it happened on one of the longest ones when they tried to do the the EVA. I I, I think the whole story is that they, they basically tried to do the EVA. They ha they had to open the hatch, so the hatch was exposed to you know the, the different temperatures and things like that. And when it came back, or, or something like that, they they basically couldn't close it or something, and then it welded shut itself or or something along those lines. They bas the basically the the temperatures in in a vacuum because they are metal and the chemistry of the metals. It just welded together, <laughs> and yeah, it's it's a whole thing. And we are awaiting confirmation that we have a successful stacking here, and we will know that once uh, the, the chopsticks there kind of uh, lower everything down, which they like still a good amount of weight is is probably resting on those chopsticks right now while they determine whether or not things have successfully mated. We did, if you're just tuning in, um, we did hear 
quite a metallic sound mm -hmm. from the field, along with some visual wobbling. And Alex, you said you saw this before on a prior stack? Yeah, one of these stacks of Ship 24 and Booster 7, uh, we saw that kind of wobble. Um, I mean, what we saw back then seemed very weird, and then we saw them going up again with a, with a ship, and then going down to sort of like put it in the right place and everything, and... You know, as I mentioned before, this is a very delicate operation. Yes. Correct? Even so it's very big <laughs> and very mm -hmm. durable, it is delicate. It is very delicate. It's a big, big vehicle here that we're talking about. So anything like this will probably not be completely good. And again, it, it is not just the booster and ship interface itself. But it is also where the booster is sitting on the pedestals on the overall launch mount. <laughs> uh, again, I don't have the full information, but it, it, right. it must not be good. Right? right? You see that and it's like, boy. Well, while we wait, our, our elves in the store are very busy because we have another full stack that'll print of this very stack available right now at shop.nasaspaceflight.com. That, this is just now. We have metallic prints already. <laughs> so that's how fast everybody works here at NSF to uh, bring you some awesome space items that you can hang on your wall and show your appreciation for the space program. You know, one of the things that I, what I love about this community is that we're all trying, you know, both uh, through social media like we do here with these streams, but everyone watching, you know, is very enthusiastic about space and shares it with their friends. And this is a great way to do that, right? When you have people over, check this out. What this is, this is how we're getting to Mars. And it's a great thing to just uh, decorate your home with. And I've got a bunch of rocket pictures throughout my house, but I don't have this one. <laughs> so you can check it out over at shop.nasaspaceflight.com. And just today, if you're just tuning in, um, we just released the new orbital flight test number two patch. As you can see, we've got those available right now. And look at the quality of these, fully embroidered. This is like one of these nice patches that like if you were going to space and you were the astronaut, this is the patch you would have on your, on your uniform. This is one of those knockoffs. This is like the real deal. And uh, these are available right now. Not only do we have this beautiful patch, this high quality designed by Pauline, but we also have a bunch of merchandise with this patch on it. Shirts, water bottles, hoodies, you name it, pillows. You can like sit back on your TV and have your cup of tea or coffee or beverage of your choice. And you could relax with the pillow right there. And on the wall, you could have one of these metallic prints. That's even got the logo in the back too. Very, very nice. So holidays are coming up. My birthday's coming up, and uh, yeah, put that put that shop up on your on your loved one's computers, and you never know what might show up under the tree or stocking or one of the whatever holiday you might celebrate that you might see from your family members as a gift. You guys, ready for some more questions? As we await some kind of confirmation of whether or not we have a successful stack or not, and uh, Josh here with a question. Lots of questions about hot staging. Um, will the thrust from S25 during hot staging mitigate or create a requirement for a booster backburn? And not so hmm. much an issue on this upcoming flight because they're not intending to get the booster back, but that certainly will have some impact on the booster if it's hot staging, I would imagine. For a booster backburn, is that like a boost backburn? Yeah, I think that's what he's talking about. Well, I mean... Uh, I don't think it really does anything in those, like, mitigate, create, or, you know, it is a requirement or, or anything like that. Um, it, pr it, it will probably help on the flip, maybe, doing some of the, you know, s some of the thrust to, to flip back. But I, I don't really, I don't really think it's going to be that huge. Might be wrong, though. 
We'll see. We'll find, it. we'll find out, right? And and in this yeah. mission, certainly they're not going to try to get this booster back. So I think they'll get some good data about what that does to the trajectory as it's uh, as it's going up. And hot staging is is not a new concept, Ryan. Right? We've seen it before on prior NASA missions. Uh, well, we've seen it before on, on vehicles from across all, all over the world. It's still in use um, today, uh, and I would argue it's most famously been used on on. Russian and ex-Soviet rockets um, that's essentially bare at least in my opinion I've always seen it the most it's 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 a it's a unique cost concept it's brand new for a reusability concept but in terms of it actually being a thing it's been around for decades and decades since basically the dawn of the of the, of the aerospace industry so a well understood um, activity, and it will be employed here on the largest rocket ever. <laughs> and we'll have to see how it how it turns out when we get to launch. And we don't yet know a launch time. And if you're just tuning in, uh, what we are watching here is the stacking of Starship uh, 25 onto booster number nine. And of course, you need these two items stacked together in order to launch them. And we are just waiting to see if it is all stacked. It looks like it's stacked, although we did I see a little bit of a wobble and uh, Jack out in the field heard some metallic clanging at the time of that wobble. So we don't know um, exactly what's going on here. And part of the problem is that this is, um, SpaceX doesn't, doesn't stream this. We don't have any kind of mission control audio. Uh, we have cameras out there in Texas. This is part of what your support of our efforts brings you is this coverage. And we have multiple cameras, as you can see, different angles. And that is uh, how we are able to bring this to you. So we have to kind of observe and see um, you know, what SpaceX is doing with the chopsticks there to determine whether or not uh, we are at a successful aiding here. So we are going to keep an eye on things for a little bit longer. And uh, so stick around and hopefully we'll have a confirmation of some kind in the near future. And our experts here are keeping a close watch on everything. And um, here's a good question, because we were talking a little bit about the heat tiles earlier. We, gets, we have some really nice views of those heat tiles um, from our cameras that you might see every once in a while on the stream today. Um, so L. Bagdell Wonk wants to know, do you think we could see the heat tiles become one manufactured piece for the main body? Because that was something I brought up, was that there's a lot of tiles on this that, as we know from the shuttle era, often pop off. Um, could they do like a gigapress equivalent once the rocket is standardized? That I could see SpaceX doing something like that, but um, Alex or, or Ryan, is this something feasible to have just a single piece that they can just apply? Alex, I'll let you, I'll let you take that one. Yeah, so um, I don't think um, they can just do one single piece, and the reason for that is that you will have a very curved piece there, whereas right now, a lot of these tiles, because they are small, sure, the boost, the, the, the ship is curved, right? It's a, it's, it's a cylinder. But if you design the tile to be as small as you can, while still not having a gazillion of them, basically a, a reasonable number of them is what I tried to mean here, right? Uh, I believe they have like 18,000, 19,000 of them on these vehicles. And, and so they are pretty much flat. The only ones that are more round are the ones on the flaps and the ones on the nose cone of the ship. All of them, the rest of, of the tiles, which is probably like 90% of all the tiles, are pretty much flat. And so if you can do away with that curve, because it's really hard to actually make a mold or a curved section and then let it cure and everything, it's a very huge piece if you were to put like whole thing you can see there uh some of the these are still flat by the way even, even though they are on the nose cone they're still flat you have right. to go a little bit higher near the tip to actually see the ones that are curved you can see on the on the left and right those arrow covers on the flaps they are curved they are curved tiles there um and they actually are put on together differently they are glued instead of with like pins they have pins for the flat ones, they have glue for the, for the curved ones. It's a whole different mechanism. Overall, what I'm trying to say is that it will complicate things more. Even though you think it's simpler, because you have just one single piece, it doesn't really make it um, simpler to manufacture, to put on and everything. It, it makes it even more complicated, even for repairs. If you got a tile off, 
You could just put another, oh, one, another on. one on. Right. And, and if right? you lose one tile, it's not the end of the world. But if you lost your whole one single PC exactly. shield, that could be really bad for, for uh, getting that back down. And I put up this chat. I clicked the wrong button and put it up too early here. But um, from the chat, if this ship lands vertically on the moon and Mars, this is a question for Ryan. How will they unload equipment if it's stored in the top part? Because it is very tall. And that's been one of the things people have been talking about as, as we all watched uh, either on a recording or live, if, if you were around during the landings on the moon before, it was just a short hop down a ladder, but but this needs an elevator, I think, Ryan, right? What we've seen in renders, conceptual renders for the HRS human landing system program from NASA is a lift from the top of Starship that sticks out just a little bit and then lowers all the way down to the lunar surface. A ladder, um, you know, thinking health and safety wise, a ladder could possibly be a contingency. They may have a spare ladder on board that they can deploy if the lift doesn't work. But it would be a long way to climb back up, right. even with the <laughs> even with the even with the gravity on the moon, which is uh, much much less than on than on Earth. Even if you did your biggest jump in a spacesuit on the lunar surface, I don't think you could make it back up to the door on Starship without some kind of assistance. Right, because it is a long way down, and you have all that equipment on. So hopefully the uh, Elevators they have um, planned will work here. There's another great view of those piles. And again, I'm interested to see how many of those stay on <laughs> as we uh, lift this thing off. And speaking of lifting off, um, another question here from Urban Pro Player: uh, How long might it take until some possible launch? We're we're pretty close if this stacking went pretty well. Is that a good assumption, Alex? Yeah, similar to what I sort of spoke about on on Twitter the other day. Uh, we have all of these sort of notices and everything uh, but they still need, need to precisely test this, this stack we think that they might do some some stack tests of these vehicles and and also wait for approval for basically get that regulatory approval from the FA and, and whatever other bodies might be left to approve anything and the issue with that is that that is a process that goes sort of behind the scenes between SpaceX and the FAA. It is not something that we are hooked on, you know, 100% of the time. It is something that if you were to ask them right now and you were to ask them 10 minutes before they publish uh, the approval, they will still say the same. They will, just because you, you ask them like 10 minutes beforehand, before that approval, they will still tell you, yeah, we're doing the approval process. You know, we're doing the review, whatever, right? It's not something that they're going to say, oh, yeah, we are absolutely in this process, in this exact timeline. They don't even know whether it's going to take, you know, an extra week, three more days, whatever, right? Um, so as I said, we're close, uh, probably days or weeks. We just don't know how close, but definitely very, very close. Right. <laughs> And if you look at what this what this area looked like after the last launch, that was it was decimated, and we now have uh, everything reconstructed. A couple of dents on the tanks back there, but they're no worse for wear, and a, and a brand new rocket. So uh, it's amazing how quickly they can turn this stuff around. I acknowledge a few more chats here. We got a five dollar super chat from my friend Lo and uh, Papa, who has a send lawn to space fund. My wife has that too. Everybody wants me to go to space, and a few people actually want me to come back. Um, but thank you for your support of the efforts here today. Here's a question from Daniel uh, Yes, If the vacuum engines on Starship do not gimbal, how will it maneuver in space? Does it have or will have cold gas thrusters like Falcon 9? Ryan, want to take, to take that? that? I believe it does have cold gas thrusters, uh, which were going to be hot gas, but they decided to run with cold gas because that's what's usually vented out of the ship anyway. Uh, which they can use for orientation. Also, at least for the first initial push up to orbit after stage step, the uh, sea level raptors are actually going to be firing. So it'll be sea level and vacuum raptors. The vacuums, as you said, can't gimbal, but the sea level ones can. So the sea level raptors, even though they're not designed for the efficiency, of, they're not designed to be efficient in the vacuum of space, they will still work and they will still be able to provide some gimbal authority on the vehicle. They just won't be used for the main uh, main grunt up into low Earth orbit. And this, this is question. something... Oh, I, I, I was just going to say that, and it is something that a lot of people get confused about, that 
um, when we talk about sea level and vacuum engines, it's not that the sea level engine only works at sea, at sea level, it also works at vacuum. And in fact, it is more like it, it is more efficient in vacuum and has more thrust in vacuum than at sea level. The difference here is that the vacuum optimized one actually takes advantage of being in a vacuum to be optimized for that environment, right? Whereas the sea level can work both at sea level and at vacuum, and it is more efficient in a vacuum, but it is not as efficient as the optimized one that we see there with the RVACs, with the Raptor vacuum engine. Got it. And then we have a super chat here wondering if there's a landing plan for Booster 9 or Starship. Nope, they're going to go into the ocean, and the hope is to just get them into orbit there. So that is the plan for this mission, but of course in the future, the next step after regular orbiting uh, success is to get these things back down to the ground and restack them just like this and send them back up again, which is their, which is what they're going to need to do for Artemis 3. Uh, Gareth is wondering, um, with a quick question here, why isn't there a landing zone 3 for SpaceX? I guess at some point there will be, <laughs> just a matter of time, right? That's a... Uh, that that, that really depends. <laughs> so, Alex, I believe that when Landing Zone 4 opened at Vandenberg, I think there was a little bit of a misconception going around that they called it Landing Zone 4 because the pad they use is Space Launch Complex 4. The Landing Zone 4 was uh, Slick 4 West, which had been converted from a launch pad into just a, a flat uh, uh, concrete pad. However, I think the real reason it was called LZ-4 is because Landing Zone 3 was meant to be at the Cape. If you saw very early animations of the Falcon Heavy, it was indicated that there would be Landing Zone 1 and 2 for side booster recovery and Landing Zone 3 for center core recovery. SpaceX, I don't believe, have actually ever recovered a center core from Falcon Heavy, either because they've lost it at sea, it's failed to land on the drone ship, or it's intentionally been expended. And I don't think we'll, we'll ever see a RTLS for the center core and they just didn't end up building LZ-3 at the pad uh, at, uh, at Cape Canaveral because they don't need it. Exactly, and as, and right, because they won't be, they'll be coming right back to, uh, well, Starship at least will come right back to uh, pad where it, where it launched from, that's the plan at least. So. It will be a literal return to launch site. It will be landing right. on the chopsticks at the launch tower. And reset and stacked and off it goes again. And uh, James L. here with a $10 super chat for Happy Happy Stack. I'm hoping it's a happy stack. We're, we don't have confirmation, but I guess, you know, this is a, a good question to bring up here is that um, if we had a problem by now, Alice, they probably would have restacked it or removed chip 25 from the top, wouldn't they? You want to take that, Brian? All right, can you say that? Can you say, say the say question we, again? Yeah, so we, you know, we, we earlier we had that uh, um, that bit of a wobble and that metallic yeah. sound <laughs> from the field. Um, but if there was a problem, they probably would have lifted it back up by now, right? I would hope so. I don't really understand if there's a problem why they would keep it on the booster for so long unless they really are spending this much time doing final checkouts of, 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 of the seam between the, the ship and the booster, for example. I think if there was an issue, they would have lifted it up again by now. However, I'm not going to definitively say that that is the case. Over the next 20, 30 minutes, if you stick with us, we may see it lift back up again. Um, so, you know, don't go anywhere. I'm not going to say that, oh, we're done for the day, and then in five minutes' time, they end up lifting it again. Um, but yeah, it seems oddly strange why they would go this long, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to say it's impossible. It certainly okay. is. Back in my day, they said, don't touch that dial because <laughs> we don't know what's <laughs> happening here yet. We'll keep an eye on things. But so far, it looks like we've got a, a healthy stack here and it could just be very well checking things out. Got a couple of questions here um, about the launch pad uh, durability. Um, one here from Siddhartha wants to know, do you think the launch pad will eventually, uh, eventually need a similar metal plate and water solution for landing in the future? That's a good question, right? Because it's going to get just as much uh, Raptor fury <laughs> coming back down as it will going up. Um, and a related question here, if I can find it again. I'm reading so many questions, and we really appreciate all the support, and I'm doing my best to keep up with uh, everybody's support and questions here. Uh, second question, kind of related to this, will the steel plate hold here as well? Because certainly uh, this pad got pretty well destroyed on the last go-around, and I, I guess, uh, Ryan, we really don't know, do we? I hope it will, you know? 
that's pretty much all I'm going to be able to confirm at this point. I hope it will. It's been designed for this process. The reason that the concrete blew up last time is because SpaceX essentially took their 50% throttle data and multiplied it by two for 100% throttle data. That clearly didn't work because the concrete, you know, turns into a rock tornado, as Das called it. <laughs> I, I really hope that this steel, this steel plate, uh, this, uh, this, this, uh, this water cooled steel plate works. You know, it is without this solution, I'm not really sure what else they can do apart from dig a, a flame trench and have a much larger total deluge system. You know, that's pretty much all they can do next. And, and this rapid turnaround design philosophy probably doesn't warrant a, a flame trench that has to be checked out between each launch. You know, that, that's really the that's really the important, the important part. Don't spoil the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's so funny when you look at this, it looks like nothing happened there. I mean, it, it's all, you know, in a sh very short period of time, you got to really give SpaceX credit for the ability that they have to just reconstruct things so quickly and add additional substantial capacity, um, especially related to that steel plating and also the uh, water system that they installed uh, in between this upcoming launch and the last one. Um, yeah, and I will also say, if you stick around to the top of the hour, there may be something that goes in a little, into a little bit more depth about this deluge plate in particular, oh, with, some, with, some, with some cool animations as well. Oh, nudge, cool. nudge, of, wink, wink. Nudge, nudge. Yeah, Stay tuned, everybody. There's a lot of these questions that try to tackle <laughs> yeah we'll keep an eye out for that uh that coming up at the top of the hour everybody and we'll take some more questions here as we wait for some kind of confirmation now we witnessed this earlier um but we did get a question here from fwm9957 about how exactly do they rotate the booster and ship around the vertical axis while stacking and that's something we we witnessed right mm around the vertical axis. So the vertical axis will be like from the ground to, to the top and then that do they mean like a sw like swinging the vehicle? Must have meant the swinging. Yeah, which is what, what we saw earlier when they cuz they you know they brought up brought up uh, ship 25 or, from the ground and then kind of rotated it into place. Or like cuz it, it can also mean, you know, rotating the vehicle left right in the position of the chopsticks without moving the chopsticks and they actually have this capability of sort of like wiggling a bit left right uh with that and i believe they actually have a, a, a bit of a, of a leeway of the angling on sort of like a, the roll will be the roll angle of the of the vehicle itself can also be be changed but just a few degrees though but that's all you need it's a very big vehicle as we were talking before at 100 to 120 meters tall, nine meters in diameter, even one degree can can mean a lot of displacement. A lot of precision here on something so mm. big, but it's got to be precise because it's got to be balanced. So there you go. I'm going to try to get through as many of our supporter chats here as I can. Uh, Dirt Foot Racing five dollar super chat. Use Starship to retrieve Snoopy, who's floating around out there somewhere. So you could certainly do that. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to totally uh, have problems uh, pronouncing this name correctly. I'm going to give it my best shot. Uh, Tanzikos Lazlo, um, Bill Kerbal here. So you want to say that rockets do wobbling. Well, this one certainly wobbled a little bit. <laughs> that was something I hadn't seen before. But Alex, you, you have seen before, right, when they were stacking? <laughs> yeah, the, the, the Kerbal wobble. That, that's very, very, uh, a very Kerbal thing. I've, I've had many rockets in Kerbal wobble and blow up. So, so far, they're, they're doing they a lot better. They need Autostrat. Than... <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and, uh, and and a rewind button. Uh, Matt That's PD, it. two things I've noticed today. The ship engine heat shield looks shorter than ship 24. That's his first thing that he noticed. And two, I think one tile has all, almost fallen off after the clank. Mm, interesting. Yeah, I did see a couple of tiles that looked a little loose, but they looked kind of loose before, but maybe they're looser now <laughs> than we saw earlier. I've been trying to keep up with... Uh, yeah, the they... The tiles are definitely not the the best of work right now, mm -hmm. and again, uh, it's 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 the whole thing that we're we're talking about that even if it gets through reentry, uh, like even if it gets to the point of reentry, that would be a very big win. And if they lose it, it's okay. They they have many other vehicles, and if you look at other vehicles, you know, Jack has captured many many 
pictures of future vehicles like Ship 28, Ship 29, and you can see all of those with their pristine heat shield tiles. It's amazing how different those are compared to these vehicles like Ship 24, Ship 25. And even then, if you look back to Ship 20, Ship 20 was horrendous. It was hideous. It, that, that thing, oh my gosh. Yeah, that was horrible. And, uh, hope the mutant gamer pull up his uh, chat here. When do you think SpaceX will try and catch Super Heavy, and how do you think the first try will go? And, you know, I, I think it's going to be trial and error <laughs> as they come back down. And, all right, I guess initially they were thinking they could, they could land at least uh, Starship just with landing legs of some kind, but that proved to be too difficult, right? It also had a lot of mass. I got to a lot of extra added mass. If SpaceX wants to get wants this vehicle to be as light as possible, as we've touched on many times today. This vehicle is huge. It weighs so much. So any little bit of mass you can subtract from the vehicle and add to the ground infrastructure instead will assist your your uh, your payload to orbit metric, which then makes the vehicle more desirable to customers. So yeah, that. It, you, you want your launch vehicle to be as light as possible, which is why those landing legs were removed. Right, and the chopsticks uh, are a much safer way to do it. And I will wait for a few of those flights before uh, I'm sent up in one of those to make sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we, again, we have a, you know, a lot of different angles here. Most of them are from the ground here, but Secret Orb says the rocket didn't just wobble. It looked like the ship lifted and dropped a couple of inches. So um, yeah, it was it was quite a quite a wobble there. It's hard It's hard to know exactly what happened because we are Looking up at the rocket, even though we're zoomed in so close, these cameras of ours are pretty much on the ground. So I think the SpaceX drones that are up, and, and certainly SpaceX's uh, engineering cameras, probably caught a better, better view of it. Alex, what did you see? Uh, well, one of the things that I'm seeing right now is that the stabilizer pins have gone in, or at least this one on the right-hand side looks to be in, which they were out before. Okay. Uh, well, that's progress. So. Right? In in the other way. Okay, oh, the other way. Will, okay. Yeah, because we will expect those to be out and the chopsticks eventually to be opened. So then going in again after going out. And maybe they're, maybe they're not I, so sure. I see. I see. We're moving cameras. There you go. See. Yeah. These were out before. I don't think. Mm -hmm. uh, that's out. Maybe we can do... It's hard sometimes to do these close-up zooms. Maybe we can do like a really quick zoom, because sometimes when you zoom in too much, it wobbles a lot. But if we do like a real quick one like this, it's probably good enough. And I think, yeah, they are they are in. I, I, I At least... It's also hard, because... Unless you do some kind of, you know... A-B kind of, you know, comparison test. It's complicated, but yeah, I'm, I'm looking back at all the cameras, and, and yeah, they, they have gone in. Hmm. That's not a good sign that, that this is a successful stack, then, in your estimation. I mean, yeah, could be. Could be also that they're doing other stuff. This hmm. is the problem here, that we are not 100% into any of these SpaceX communications and, and deliberations and things like that, right? And so it could be just that they decided to do this, but it could also be that they're going to lift again the ship and try to, you know, put it down on the booster more properly. We, we, we just don't know. Right. Right. And, and again, we are um, not privy to SpaceX's communications here. We happen to just be across the street. <laughs> so we're able to uh, get our cameras uh, zoomed in to the activities here. But what Alex is uh, noticing here is that the pins that um, kind of secure the Starship to the chopsticks have gone back in, which leads him to speculate perhaps that they're not yet ready to have this stack stand on its own. And that's what we're waiting on here to see what happens. So we will keep an eye on that. Um, lots of questions about the hot staging ring. We have one here from Marvin Hu. Um, about how is the ring attached to the booster? I'm guessing the same way they attach each segment, just welding it together. Is that right? The 
The hot staging ring. The hot staging ring, yeah. It is it is basically just using the same pins as the as the the chips were, were using before. And one thing that we mentioned before in regards to the weight is that um, the you know they have to calculate not only for the weight of the entire stack on the ground, but also the weight of the stack when it's fueled, and then the weight of that ring taking three Gs of force plus as it goes to orbit. So they've you know mm. good engineering, you, you know what you need, and uh, that's what they have put together for uh, that hot fire ring. So that's the hot staging ring. That is why it is. Uh, and they're confident, as we are, that it can hold the weight, and that might be one of the things they're checking right now is to make sure that it can. And here's a question um, from Jay Hassan 1100 for Ryan. Um, with the introduction of the hot staging ring, does this mean that Starship is capable of a launch abort maneuver if needed? That's a good question because, you know, on, on Dragon, at the top of the Falcon 9 second stage, has a launch abort system that can just pull away from uh, the the lower stack and get away if need be. What about launch escape? Launch I abort. think that a potential launch abort capacity would have been available to the previous design. It just would have fried the top of the booster at the point of abort. And to be honest, if the, if if you have a launch abort because of the booster, frying your booster is probably no longer your biggest worry because it probably would have fried itself so i don't think the addition of a hot stage ring would have added any launch abort capability to the ship if anything it'll be exactly the same capability as before and even if that will be integrated at some point you know because spacex wants this wants this vehicle to be as reliable as an airliner and airliners don't have launch abort capabilities you know they can glide which admittedly starship can't right. but it's it's not really it's not really something they want to have to have Right. At, at, at this point in time, that sounds kind of terrible, to be honest. But it's like this uh, in years in the future, this won't be a test flight program anymore. This will be like getting on a plane from London to New York. Right. And those planes from London to New York have have redundancies as their fallbacks so that if you do lose a system, the other systems can often uh, make the difference there. And we're gonna stick with this everybody because what we are trying to determine is whether or not we have a successful stack. And we don't yet know if we do. We have some signs to indicate that SpaceX isn't sure either, um, given some pins that we saw go back in to uh, ship, 20, uh, ship 25 there on the top of booster nine. So we are gonna stick with this stream here and just see what happens next here. You might see if it didn't go right, Alex. They'll pick it back up again. Yeah, we'll we'll try to keep an e uh, an eye on this, and you know it it is very important because this is the first time we've seen that wobble. We've seen, you know, as I mentioned before, they had those stabilizers out, which normally indicates they are done for the day, or 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 that at least they have reached a very stable position. But now that they have gone in, it kind of makes me wonder whether they're going to lift it again you know just in general what's going to happen with this with this full stack and so it, it is very wise to to keep an, an eye on this for a little bit longer yeah so we will do that and uh, we will have something to uh, tease everyone with in a little bit that i know the viewers will find of interest but we're going to keep an eye on things here to see exactly what's going on over at starbase um, here's a question that we did answer before, but I think, you know, we've got people coming in and out of the uh, chat here. And this was from Apocalypse Cow, who wants to know if this is the same profile as the test flight. And we believe it will be. We don't think there's going to be any modified milestones. So it will likely follow the same um, flight plan as before, which is to get into orbit and go around the Earth once and then uh, come back down near Hawaii. That's the, the plan at the moment. So we'll have to see. Uh, if there's any changes, we'll certainly see that. I think Alex probably in the FAA filing, right? Yeah, um, we don't really, we, we don't fully know though. Um, I'm mostly sure that the license will be unchanged. Only that line where it says, you know, this license is only valid for the first flight. It's like actually one of the conditions is this license is only valid for this first flight unless modified so if it is amended and modified to remove that line then the whole thing works for whatever 
other launch of a starship from here from the starbase that you know has the same nominal plan of going out booster lands on the on the gulf the you know the, the ship goes all the way to to hawaii it splashes down on the ocean at terminal velocity if you plan that then that's pretty much all the the launch license says the other kinds of things that might be not on the license itself but sort of going along it might be some kind of maybe extra review we had for the first flight they had already done an environmental review in 2022 but for for the first flight they went an extra step probably to make sure that everything was correct and you know uh, dotting the i's and crossing the t's and everything and they did a uh, sort of review an environmental review of the review <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, where they were like, okay, we did the environmental review last year, and does this launch profile still meet the requirements? You know, all of the things that we established last year, and you know, the 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 solution to that, the, the sort of the final answer was yes, it does work with that as established, and we got a lot of information even, you know, renders of the ship and things like that. It could be that for the second flight, because now they have the water system, right? Now they have right. hot staging ring, whatever, like there's some changes. Maybe they decided to also do this kind of short environmental review. It's not as long as the as, as the other one, because it's a specific to this launch in particular. So they might have done that. And if they do that, that might be released with the, with the launch license, which you well, it will be neat. I'm, I'm really hoping, you know, that they do some kind of release of, of this kind of paperwork. So we got a lot of insights. Yeah, I'm sure it would be nice to know exactly what's going to happen here because our viewers want to know. So we will keep an eye on that. And as soon as we find out some things, uh, we will definitely get that to you. Uh, Brent Wolf here is uh, speculating that perhaps it could be um, checking whether the vent ring will actually hold the weight of S25. Simulated tests are one thing, which they did do, but maybe applying incremental weight from the chopsticks to be sure, that could be. You know, we just we, we just don't know. We'll have to just keep an eye on things and see uh, what changes down there at Starbase. But one thing is certain, our cameras are gonna stay on this until we know what the outcome of this stacking is. And in some ways, Ryan, you know, this is, although an operational thing, this is also a testing thing too at the same time. Yeah, everything from what we're seeing now is essentially a test. As Elon has said multiple times himself, Boca Chica is their testing facility. This is, you know, what Seattle is to Boeing, what Toulouse is to Airbus. This is where the testing takes place. And then they can have, uh, in, in air quotes, official spaceports outside of Boca Chica, such as Cape Canaveral, for their high-profile, you know, missions to the moon. Everything we see here is a test. It's what This is the research and development facility. That's what this place is built for. And that is it. So, you know, everything that happens here, even if it doesn't look like it's a success in the sense that the outcome that they wanted to get was achieved, the fact is that it's best to find the things that don't work when you are still in the development phase versus the operational phase. And that's, uh, that's what it's all about. And that's how SpaceX kind of approaches things, which is, you know, stress it till you break it and, and learn from that. And that's, uh, that's what we've seen over and over again here. There's some uh, views here. Alex, we're looking at those pins again, right? Yep, um, those Still are there. definitely <laughs> in. Yeah. Uh, so right, so right now the the weight of of the uh, ship twenty five here is not on the booster. It's being held by those chopsticks. Well, right now I don't really know because we didn't have an sort of like an un wobble, <laughs> <laughs> the the opposite of the wobble that we saw before. I'm not fully sure. Um, I'm looking at all the cameras, you know, going back and forth and seeing if there's been any sort of movement uh, of sorts. Yeah, trying to, to you know, see if there's any indication. It is definitely true that these stabilizers seem to have gone in, you know, after they went out, then they went in, as I was mentioning before. And that seemed to have been about 20 minutes or so and so you 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 think that they will have lifted this already if they wanted to 
to set it down properly, right? Right. That's sort of my thinking here. So, yeah. And if you're <clears throat> if you're just tuning in, what what we observed a little bit earlier was that the you know everything looked like it was going fine, and they lowered uh, chip twenty five down into booster nine, and then we got to a point where we saw here on the cameras some definite wobble. It was almost as if they they let go of the weight just to see if it could handle it, and. When we observed the wobble, Jack on the ground, who's uh, right across the street from this pad, uh, said that he was able to hear an audible clanging sound, like two things kind of not colliding, but coming together. And so um, what we observed after that happened is the pins that uh, kind of secure Starship uh, went back in. So what we don't know is if this is according to plan, if this is something SpaceX is just trying to troubleshoot or, or they're just trying to validate. Um, we don't know. We'll have to just keep an eye on things, and we're going to keep our cameras trained on the stack here. Uh, it is still standing, so that's a good sign, and uh, we'll, we'll wait and see uh, what happens. Now, we don't have um, any kind of audio from SpaceX because SpaceX activities, they'll stream things like you know, the, the hot fires and stuff, but this is an activity that uh, we're bringing to you with our cameras, which are located all around Starbase. And this is... Uh, how your support helps bring bring this coverage to you because we have infrastructure that we can provide it. And we have a close-up photo to look at, I'm told, in the back channel. You can pop that up real quick. I think Alex is going to like this one. That. Mm -hmm. And that's a shot from today from Jack, which I believe this is available in the store also if you want a metallic print of it. This would look great as a metallic print, I think. I think it's the other one. Oh, the other one. The okay. one I, think, with uh, a... I think the one in the store was taken a little bit later than this one. Okay. Uh, yeah. But this okay. one is certainly very high res, and we, we get a wonderful, like if we zoom into this here, we get some wonderful details of the Raptors and such. Yeah, it's definitely, you can see there that, that sort of plate on top of the the cooling pipe on the nozzle extension of the, of the RVAC. Um, that is definitely... An interesting thing, I hadn't seen that before, and yeah, if, if maybe we can go a little bit to, to like the ship itself, not the engines. You can see there's like two pipes on each side of the vehicle, one on the left and one on the right, and the sort of the closest one to the, to the flaps, that's the one that, that is used for the engine chill. And the other one is new. That that was not there for Ship Twenty Four. That was a this is a recent addition for Ship Twenty Five as well, because it wasn't there when you know it was back in the pad, uh, like just two months ago. So this is definitely new new stuff. We don't really know if it's like an extra engine chill pipe of sorts, but definitely a really nice detail view here of the aft section here of the ship you see some of that engine shielding the black shields there the the green nozzles it's really really amazing you see some of those engine numbers 126 not sure what the other was but yeah, yeah 126 close <laughs> really close up yeah, this is awesome. The other one seems to be also a 120 something. That's an R for the Raptor. Yeah. You, you Ooh. Know oh, look at that. Look at the at the booster. Can we can we look at the booster for a moment, please? Because that's the perch of the oh, yeah. booster section. So this is a new addition that it is coming on for Booster 9 that Booster 7 didn't have. It's sort of like its own fire extinguisher system. Um, it basically vents the... Just like we saw on the ship on that picture, it has like shields between the engines. The same thing happens with Booster 9, but instead of having six engines, it has 33. And, you know, these engines leak. You cannot achieve a leak rate of exactly zero. You always have some leakage and basically these shields contain that leakage and you want that leakage to actually go out because if you have a spark some source of ignition it goes up it, it goes up in flames and it damages your engine you don't want that 
and that was probably one of the reasons why Booster 7 failed. We saw some of the, you know, once it go, it, it went up and we looked into the engine section, I saw a lot of fire going on there. And not <laughs> just coming from the engines itself. That's the kind of fire you the, want, right? <laughs> exactly. Not the, the fire of the engines, but fire in the engine section. You could see the engine section itself was orange. This is, so way, this is not a fire system. we're watching. This is, this is a, uh, a purge of, of exactly. the lines here. Okay, great. Exactly. So this system, we believe, it is precisely to avoid this, where they have these vents on the outer uh, portions of the of the aft section, right above those shields, you know, between the engines and the shields, and they allow them to be able to purge all of that methane, all of that nasty stuff that you don't want on your engine being, you know, caught, you know, catching fire. If you have this system then you don't have engine fires. And you have a lot more chances for your engines to survive all the way through through main engine cutoff. So basically a, a so, uh, yeah. going fire extinguisher <laughs> to keep, yep. uh, keep um, un, un, uh, de basically uh, un unapproved fires from, <laughs> from erupting outside of the place where it's supposed to be on fire. And uh, is, is this a, a good sign that we're venting this now that we have a successful stack? Well, it's definitely a sign that they're testing something on the vehicle. It is definitely kind of magic because you gotta you gotta imagine. We're actually talking about these purges, by the way. When I when I talked about the the vents on the outside of the ship, this is sort of how it looks like. Um, so now we see that it's sort of shutting down. But this is something that we're probably gonna see the whole two and a half three minutes of ascent for the booster. Maybe not continuous, but maybe pulsing. It's it's something that obviously we're all we're, we're all gonna figure out once they actually launch it. But it is cool. Uh, that rocket is gonna look very cool, you know, venting all the way up, and and maybe it will look even different once it goes into you know thinner parts of the atmosphere. Yeah. They're very cool. Let me get a couple more super chats in. It looks like we might be nearing the end of this, but we'll keep a close eye for another couple minutes here and see if anything. Uh, changes. Yeah, let's do, I, we have so much support here. I'm going to try my best to get everybody acknowledged, but uh, we'll, we'll do our best. We have so many uh, people buying those patches. <laughs> so, um, Mike D has a question here about, uh, this is kind of down the road, if they're not able to catch the ship and booster on the on the chopsticks, will this whole idea fail? And Ryan, I, I guess the fact that the chopsticks can, can hold the weight indicates that as long as they can maneuver accurately enough, this shouldn't be an issue, right? Yeah, that that really. Yeah, the, 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 that that makes total that makes total sense. You know, it's. Hmm. You think about yeah, like the the wind at, yeah. at the you know you're gonna have wind issues too. So like you know there's a lot. I think there's gonna be a lot that goes into having a a green weather <laughs> report for these. Yeah, yeah. Um, because it's, you, a, you it's want... a good point to make because mm -hmm. the point of deleting the the landing legs was to save mass, and this is right. kind of a. This is kind. Of, they haven't proved it works yet. This does seem kind of like a bonkers out of their idea. But I mean, if we're honest, it propulsively landing a booster at all seemed like a bonkers out their idea <laughs> in 2015, and yet they they did it in December of that year. You know, so I think SpaceX is the right company to try and make bonkers out of their ideas, out, bonkers out of the world ideas, reality. You know. And people thought propulsive landing of a first stage booster was bonkers on a on a barge no less, which they yeah have been able to do now. Uh, pretty They've uh, pretty executed it perfectly hundreds of times. Uh, I'm not sure if it's hundreds of times yet, but I think it's over 150 times ish or somewhere around there consecutively. I could see them maybe having to extend the length of the chopsticks. I mean, there's a lot that they can you know they can experiment with you know with this design and again we know that it can handle both the weight of of uh the booster and and starship individually so it's just a matter of maneuvering which is obviously the last the last couple inches are the <laughs> are the ones that matter the most here but that's certainly something they're gonna working on but i think first they want to get this this sucker into orbit which is uh the first objective there um one more question here from pascal i, I don't think we took this one before um, again, about the, the hot staging ring, that's a very popular uh, question amongst our viewers because it is a new component to this. Uh, 
thought that cryogenic fuel in the tanks is what provided its strength. That said, how does the staging ring retain strength during takeoff with less material and no cryo? Because there's definitely less material there, but you've got some structural support in, in those vents that obviously, at the moment, appear to be supporting the weight of Starship, especially when they released it for a little bit. Alex, what do you think about that? It definitely has a lot of reinforcements, and the the shield itself, the dome there, the shield there, um, has a lot of reinforcements on the inside. And so you can see, mm, you know, on some of the pictures that SpaceX published, you can see a lot of reinforcements there that might contribute to, to it being structurally sound. So, and, and then at the end of the day, they, they have also tested it as well, right? We, we saw that uh, hot staging ring test, uh, test article that they have at Massey's. Um, it's already completed testing. It's put on, you know, they, they have these completed um, vehicle already put there. And so I, I, I don't think it's a problem during these sort of static moments. It's gonna be, to me, it's gonna be more of a thing when it is going up and doing its whole thing and catching acceleration with that chip, getting, you know, or, or at least feeling like it is more and more heavier onto that onto that uh, hot staging ring. That's gonna be definitely the moment of truth. Right, and that we hopefully will see a little bit. And on that note, we have to go through a little bit of a shift change here because I have to get on to a other activity that I am, I am obligated to. Um, but I will be tossing it over to Ryan to introduce a number, another member of the NSF crew who will be joining us to continue this coverage here of the stacking of booster, or chip 25 to booster nine. And I want to thank uh, all, all of you who are tuning in and staying tuned in and to my friends here on the call today. I learn something every time I do this with all of you. So I, I'm just enjoying uh, being a part of the team and uh, thank you all for the dedication here. Turn it Thanks, over to Ryan. John. We were going for well, just over three hours now, so um, you heard his voice last night. I'm gonna. Everyone knows Adrian. How are you doing, Adrian? Doing good. Why was the OLM venting, Alex? Well, we we kind of explained that. Do, do you want me to explain it again? Okay, I can okay, do it. I, I, I'm Adrian <laughs> doesn't even watch the stream. What? Uh, I, come come on. I watched. Come on, I watched, come but on. I, come I watched, on, but I also got some drink to get ready for the stream because I knew I was had right, going to have one. Right. Like okay. I I was basically setting down, and it was like, why is it venting? What's what's happening here? <laughs> Yeah, so we saw those those sort of vents. Um, we we sort of talk about it being the booster's own fire extinguisher system, where it vents out all of the cavities between the engines and you know the shields and everything. That keeps it nice and and not fiery. We want the fire coming out of the engines, but not from the engine section. That's a different thing. <laughs> so yeah. I'm going to look through here for some more questions um, for those of you just joining us. If you're a, if you're a seasoned NSF viewer, you'll know that if you if you want uh, your questions to come into the queue here, tag us a chat at NASA Space Flight. We will do our best to answer them. I'll be tossing them here over to Alex and Adrian um, because the, I, I'll be honest, they know, they know a bit more than I do. Um, so, uh, but for the moment, uh, I have just been kind of scrolling through all of the different store messages we've been getting from the hundreds and i'm not exaggerating the hundreds of people who have been purchasing items off of the store today it 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 is all immensely appreciated the support off of the store is great because not only do you support us to expand our coverage but you also get something physical in return such as the new uh the new patch design um for the second integrated flight test uh but at least for the moment i'm going to toss to this question from Kat asking, which is an interesting point to make, something that our uh, our team on the Floridian coast will be more than accustomed to, asking, what about the impending hurricane season that would impact launch day possibilities? Adrian, do we think that uh, poor weather, such as hurricanes, will impact launch day possibilities negatively? Uh, I mean, yes, uh, definitely. Uh, bad weather uh, in, a, in a like really, really bad way 
could 100% impact launch readiness for Starship. I would imagine that they are, they would not like to push the envelope yet with uh, what they can do with Starship. I feel like they, they want to still treat it safe. So yes, I think bad weather for sure has some sort of implications for potential launch date and potential launch windows. Yeah, the... That's good, or not good rather. One of the things to, to point out, though, is that at least for the remaining of the week, it doesn't look like there's anything coming down to stories. Cross our fingers, knock on wood, all of the rituals that you want to do, right? Uh, at least the forecast doesn't spell any bad juju for, for Starbase. It does look like, at least for Florida, though, there's that Tropical Depression 13, soon to be Hurricane Lee, probably. That's, yeah, we, we're going to have to keep an eye, but that's going to be affecting Falcon 9. And Matt asking a little while ago, uh, uh, will they repair the orbital tank farm from the fir from damage from the first flight? Now, Alex, we were talking about this uh, a few hours ago, but many new people have joined us since then. Um, the, the, the tanks, there are two white uh, or kind of creamy colored shells they seem pretty beaten up. Will that impact the orbital tank farm? Will that need repairing? Uh, well, it is already fixed. So the, the straight answer is, don't worry, it's already repaired from the, from the damage. And we know that because they have already used it. Um, we've seen not only the static fires of Booster 9, we have also seen these, like, it, it had spin prime tests. It also had a cryo test where it was fully loaded with liquid oxygen and liquid nitrogen. Uh, so, no, we, we know it works, especially those two tanks, one of them is not being used, it's empty pretty much, and the other one, it is for water, and they have already used water, not for the deluge system, but for the fire system, which is the one that basically displaces all of the bad stuff underneath the engines to not repeat the same as the sort of explosion on the pad from Booster 7. It's a whole long story for that, but yeah, they they pull out some of the dents, but it's not really completely needed to be fully, perfectly cylindrical. It works. And Andrew is asking, Adrian, I'll toss this to you, why wouldn't they close the vents on the hot staging ring to prevent drag, or I'd say you can't really prevent drag, but rather minimize the drag of the vehicle? Well, it, it, I think it has multiple reasons. A, it would make the system much more complex because you would need a whole system that closes it. And the problem also is it's a fairly important part then because if that fails, well, you suddenly have an enclosed hot staging ring, which is like the, like the exact opposite of what you want to have. Um, also, I do not think it has that much impact on drag. At least, at, at as, uh, after some speeds, because uh, this, like it's it's like Whitfins. I think at some point it will just be be very very tough, and uh, you basically don't have any airflow going through that that much anymore. Um, I don't think it's that much of an impact. And again, it would be a very complicated system, and a quite quite important one that needs to work. If it doesn't work, you're you're suddenly in way more trouble, and. Uh, yeah, would, would probably, and I also don't see that much p potential to even hide such a system, right? Because if you look at the, it there, like, it's it's it would not be trivial to to close these these vents. People can like you know fit in them. They're not you know from from this perspective, they maybe look I don't know five ten centimeters wide. No, these can literally fit a person inside of as we've seen before. Um, from imagery from SpaceX. Uh, yeah, like if their if their whole ring is about two meters, like every of these holes is by like like 80, 90 centimeters in in height. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just the scale is mind boggling. It's it's completely uh, bonkers. There, there we go. They, they, there you go. It's literally a person going through a hole there to work on something on the outside. And someone sitting on their phone on the top. Anyways, Florida Man is asking: <laughs> Has this ship quick disconnect uh, connected up to ship twenty-five yet, Annex? Nope. 
Um, you can see it there on the right. The ship, we believe, but um, one, one of the things that I was sort of talking about before is that one of the things that we should look for is people coming back to the pad, and not only to the OLM, but also up to the tower and reconnect, basically helping reconnect the quick disconnect. I do not believe the vehicle, you know, the ship itself, is right now in a position to accept the quick disconnect and mostly you know the accepting part is basically they need to to work on it in order to prepare it uh, they prepared only for the lift and one of the things that they uh, that we shall see later down the line once they come back is we'll see these hand cranked pulleys uh they, they have like this pulley system with with like a a work uh stand next to the it basically swings to the to the quick disconnect and and people can work on on the quick disconnect and you know remove covers and attach probes sensors and things like that that is a, a normal thing that we see for for these things prior to connecting the quick disconnect on the vehicle and um another i say easy question but there's probably a lot of things that go into this. Everyday Space Nerd is asking, uh, could we see a flight this week? Adrian, you were there for the fl for the first flight. Will this thing fly before Sunday? Okay, there's two answers here. A uh, in in <laughs> theory, in theory, yes. Like if you just go by, could could they do it? In theory, yes. Will it practically work? Probably no. They just stacked it. They will still need to probably check this out, perform at least one more test with it, destack it, then arm the FTS, then restack it, and then get ready for launch. I mean, it's. Uh, if we go by the original timeline, they might be able to pull out a, a attempt on Monday if like everything goes wrong, uh, right? Um, but. I, I don't think I don't think like before Monday is in any way realistic. So yes, in theory they could. If everything drops now, every regulatory part is, is ready, every hardware part works flawlessly, in practice, no, they probably won't be a launch this week. Thanks very much for that. If anyone was you know if anyone's there right now and and, and leaving at the end of the week and they're expecting anything. There you go. There's your, there's your, I'd say, unfortunate answer for your circumstance. Uh, but as we said, in you should probably be thinking about this. Don't book anything just yet, because we don't know when it's going to be, and we don't want you to book things and then not be able to actually see it because you booked too early. Uh, but something that you will be able to see, because you booked right on time and you are within this broadcast right now on uh, our YouTube channel, in just over two minutes' time, we are going to be premiering a video we've had in the works for a little while now myself alex and um a familiar name you'll probably would have seen on space twitter before ryan hansen we've been working on a video with the water steel the steel water cooled plate it's the hottest ironically the hottest topic ahead of ift2 it is essentially the million dollar question will the plate work will it save the pad will it make the pad rapidly reusable because the vehicle's intended to be rapidly reusable but the pad at least on ift1 standards was not rapidly reusable we've seen them working for months and months and months refurbishing the pad putting concrete back introducing deluge systems and all of that jazz so in just over a minute's time we will be tossing you over to that premiere uh, but at least from Starbase's perspective, Alex, just very quickly, could you give us a rundown of, Ed, of the of the next steps for this booster and uh, ship? Yeah, just as I mentioned before, we are hoping to see people coming back to the to the overall launch mount, and once they go back, they'll hook up everything, and hopefully, we see some testing coming up soon. Sounds good. So yeah, as we can see right now, there appears to be some tarp flapping about. They've got a telehandler down there as well with uh, with their bit with their big um, what is that AR eleven thousand crane or something along those lines. Underneath that pad right there is where that deluge plate is. It's worked pretty well for the static fire, but the static fire is only at fifty percent of the total thrust of that booster. 
for the concrete, that was 50, for the concrete static fire rather, that was 50% thrust and SpaceX thought it would work and it clearly didn't for the first flight test, the first integrated flight test of Starship. So fingers crossed in a week or two, if everything fast tracks and goes at, you know, the most efficient speed possible, could we see a flight? Could we see this system working? Those are some of the questions that we are going to be trying to answer in this video that is premiering in just a few seconds time. So there's pretty much 12,000 of you still with us. Don't go anywhere. You don't want to miss this video. Any question, fingers crossed, any question you might have about the Daegu plate should be answered within the next half hour of your time. So don't go anywhere. Keep an eye out on the channel. You should be automatically redirected to the video and all of your questions, fingers crossed, should be answered. So from myself, I'm Ryan Caton. We've had uh, Lon Sideman hosting the stream for the first three hours. Alex has been with us as well. Uh, uh, I'll be also in the premiere with, with all of his mind. Chat. And we will be in the premiere chat as well. Adrian, thanks for coming on. And Kevin, thanks very much for producing the stream as well. Jack and Sean, I believe, have also been taking photos and, and such in the field. So thank you all for joining us for this broadcast. But again, don't go anywhere. Watch the premiere and we'll see you next time. Bye bye.